are listening to Gorgas, you idiot. John Bates. Yes. What's going on, brother? How much? Thank Just, you. Uh, you. Chilling. Chilling. You made it. I made it. We I was I was up late last night, uh, eating food and drinking beer, and I was like, man, I gotta shake this. I gotta shake this off. This this uh, this food. Ha- I have a food hangover right now. It's like <laughs> I didn't even drink that much. I just ate a lot. You know what I mean? You still feeling the effects of the food coma? I'm still feeling the effects of the food coma. Yeah. Um, let's get this right right in front of you here. Um, there you go. So John Bates, thank you for coming in, dude. Um, I wanted to bring you on the podcast. Have you done a podcast like this before? It's been a while. It's been yeah. a while. Okay, cool. Uh, for people that don't know who you are that aren't in the restaurant business or, um, you know, not in Texas, I do still have a lot of friends from back home that listen, you know what I mean, but that unfortunately haven't made it out here yet. Yeah. Um, you are John Bates. You're the pit master uh, and chef owner of Interstellar Barbecue mm-hmm. uh, and Yellow Bell Tacos now. Yeah. Right? Um, but, yeah, man, thanks for coming on. Um I guess I just wanted to. How you doing? I'm good. You know, yeah. um, enjoying my Monday. It's nice. It's always the day to have fun. And Monday is your day off. It, it is. So it that's is. a little different from it's a, it's from a your chill day for me. Right so. from your at from your average schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Nice. Um, so yeah, I guess I was just I just wanted you to kind of tell your story a little bit on here, and um, you know, we can talk about whatever really, but. Um, you know, so when did you? There's things that I feel like I don't know as well. So like okay. like when did you uh, start? Like, when did you find that you were super into cooking and you wanted to own a restaurant or like, did that kind of just evolve over time as like, you know, you got like got a job because you needed a job and then you kind of found your passion for it or have you like, oh, did you always grow up cooking or, you know, how did that, how did that manifest? I mean, for me, it was, it's kind of a long story. Um, well, we all, got time. All I've done is work in restaurants essentially. Okay. Um, what was when that? I, <clears throat> Probably when I was 16, maybe 17, I don't know, when I was still living back home in Corpus Christi. Mm-hmm. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, from the neighborhood, Wade, was like, hey, do you want to make some money this summer? And I was like, of course, because like every 16-year-old kid needs money oh, right, yeah. to go to buy, buy whatever candy. You know, 16-year-olds buy. You know? <laughs> and uh, he says, well, come up to this restaurant, this place called Gallagher's, and we'll get you started. <clears throat> I was like, cool. And what kind of food was, was that? Um, it's a steakhouse, or it was a steakhouse in Corpus Christi. It's no longer there. Okay. But, um, show up and uh, get there, and the first thing he says, all right, well, you're going to be working the dish pit. This is going to be where you start. And that was my entryway <laughs> into dude, running restaurants. So. From start, you actually yeah. start at the bottom, dude. Uh, you really did. Yeah, very much so. That's, so no no culinary school story for you. You're, yeah. you, you're straight straight out the mud from, Stri- the, dis- from yeah. the dish pit. Uh, from the dish pit to my current position, I've worked just about every spot in a restaurant except for bartend. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, I've bust, I've cooked, I've waited tables, I've prepped, I've been the chef. Um, I've worked my way through restaurants. You did the whole fine dining thing too. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And you don't, you're not into that really, right? I mean, is that kind of like over time you're like you, somewhere you found out that. That's not what you wanted to do. Well, I mean, I love fine dining. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I truly enjoy going out and having dinner at a restaurant that's driven by a chef who's creative, progressive with his food, um, intellectual, um, who is really into, like, crafting food as an art or a high craft, if you will. Yeah. Um, I just found at a certain point that that um, style of business, you're catering to a really small group of people. It's like... You know, most Americans don't go out to fine dining. It's just right. not their thing. You can't serve everybody yeah. and, and be with the normal folks. Yeah, so <laughs> I was just kind of getting, you know, kind of was starting to fall out of love with the idea of only cooking for, like, 2% of the of the people out there. Mm-hmm. So that's when I started looking at, like, taking my skill sets that I had learned over, you know, 15, 20 years in the restaurant industry and uh, transitioning to something more casual where I could have a reach and actually cook for people, like, everyday folks. Yeah. And so when did you, so you're, you're born and raised in Texas, yeah, right? And so was barbecue was always a part, you know, of your life, yeah? I mean, barbecue, tacos, and chicken fried steak have been a part of my life from <laughs> pretty much out of the womb, you know? Yeah. It's like uh, you roll out with a taco in one hand and, you know, you're, <coughs> looking, for the, the you're other. looking for the barbecue as soon as you can walk. Um, but yeah, no, uh, barbecue is, runs deep in my family. Um, mm-hmm. Like, you know, if you're born and raised in Texas and if you have deep roots in Texas, um, barbecue is, it's just like, it's just always there, you know, yeah. it's just part of culture. Mm-hmm. So. And so when you just inevitably just picked up on the, 
the cook the cooking style and stuff over time and honed it in or like like when did you make your first do you remember when you nailed your first brisket because i imagine you know and this isn't necessarily a barbecue podcast i sure. want to talk more about you but yeah. i mean barbecue is a part of what you do uh, so. it's a big part of, it's way, a big part of what you do so yeah. it's like but when do you how much how many briskets did you screw up before you uh before you figured it out <laughs> before you nailed it i feel like if you were given me if you were just gonna give me a brisket right now uh-huh and I had to trim it and do everything just from what I've seen. I don't think I don't know. I, it wouldn't be good. Yeah. I don't think it would. I don't think it would go over very well. You know, honestly, um, I, I don't have a hard count, but I would say, you know, when I decided to go into barbecue professionally, uh-huh. um, I hadn't really cooked much barbecue ever. I mean, I'd helped my uncles and my father make barbecue and done a lot of grilling and been in restaurants for forever. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, when I decided I wanted to pursue it professionally, essentially we bought a pit and I just started cooking. Okay. And um, over about four weeks, um, I decided that I was ready to go. Oh, really? <laughs> so it's just uh, just a month of, of R&D? Yeah, a month of R&D. And during that time frame, we were bringing in, um, you know, different uh, grades of brisket uh, from different producers different suppliers and we were cooking you know two or three briskets a day during that time period was this just at home or was this at the restaurant it was at the restaurant okay at noble pig yeah yeah. which is what interstellar used to be yeah so we were kind of in between restaurants we were resetting the space Mm kind of getting it ready and every day um me and war dog um were cooking briskets and ribs and uh kind of honing what we thought our craft would be in barbecue Mm -hmm. so we did that for about a month and then i was like well you know we're ready. Let's open up a barbecue joint. <laughs> you sometimes <laughs> you just have to send it. Well, I mean, you know, the best cooks cook intuitively. <clears throat> if you understand like temperature and timing and how to like work temperature and food and the basics of it, um, you know, if you got that down, you just got to practice a little bit and you should be able to figure it out. Right. Um. So you always were going to open a barbecue restaurant of some sort or was you got you explain to people kind of what, how interstellar came about i guess yeah. explain to me even I, I i know a little bit but you know give us the story i sure. guess well i think that i was destined to always open up a barbecue restaurant at some point in time i just yeah. think that's in my dna yes yeah. you know i love barbecue um it's one of those types of food that i seek out when i travel especially mm-hmm. in texas and small towns back roads looking for like these little gyms these little hidden spots um But, you know, I started in the restaurant industry a long time ago when I was 16. I have been in the food industry now for close to 30 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I was had opened up and was running a restaurant called Noble Sandwich Company, which was originally called the Noble Pig. Um, It had been open for about nine years and I was thoroughly burnt out um, running that restaurant and was ready for a change. So that's kind of how. Um, the idea for barbecue became more of like a, well, maybe I can take my passion for this food and transition into that and find more love in the right. restaurant industry long term, running a barbecue place as opposed to the sandwich shop that we were running. Okay. So, yeah. And then, so it just kind of naturally happened. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, when you're running a, when you're running, it's, it was natural, but it was also necessary. Like I was at a phase in my restaurant career where I was like, if I don't figure out a better way to do this, mm-hmm. like I'm probably going to be done. I'm going to do something else. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to get out of them because the amount of like blood, sweat, and tears, and uh, physical hours that I was putting into running a restaurant wasn't really returning. Uh, you weren't like stoked on on. Yeah. I wasn't happy. You weren't happy. No. Yeah, I was ready to either find a better way, <laughs> travel a different road, or you know, move on to a whole different mm-hmm. phase of my life. What was it about like the sandwich shop that was that wasn't doing it for you anymore? Like, was it just you're just sick of putting stuff between two <laughs> pieces of bread? Like, like, I mean, sandwiches are tough okay. uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but yeah, I mean, that restaurant that I ran at Noble, um, we just turned it into this beast. It was like too much to manage. Okay, everything was made from scratch. We were bread? making, yeah, I mean, oh, we were making wow. six, seven different types of bread every day. We were making four or five different types of pickles. We were curing all of our meats in house. We were mm-hmm. putting all this love and attention into making a sandwich, which in Austin, um, <coughs> you know, they don't. 
put as much value on. It's not a sandwich. It's not a big sandwich place. No, it's not. you kind of have to search high and low for a good sandwich yeah. around here, dude. Yeah, they just they don't. It's not part of the culture, and they just they don't appreciate the effort put into it. So right. we were running this like chef-driven restaurant with lots of people making sandwiches, and we couldn't really charge what we needed to get to, to get by. You right, because you, your people are like. 16 bucks for a sandwich yeah. or however much it was I mean, gosh we we're only charging like 12 and 13 and people oh, were yeah. giving us like shit all the They're time like i can make a sandwich at home exactly. i could go to i could go to heb i can't tell you how many times i heard that really yeah you know or you can go to subway and get a five dollar foot long mm. so there just wasn't the appreciation for the the craft that we were putting into it it was a lot of work i mean it was yeah. really hard work we were and we were also hustlers like we never said we never said no to anybody when it came to like, customizing and shit. To, well, well, just trying to like, you know, to make a buck. I mean, you get raised like in American culture. You're told if you work really hard and you hustle, that you will find success. Mm -hmm. And so we took caterings, we took weddings, we did delivery, we did breakfast, we did lunch, we did dinner, um, we did everything we could to try to make sure that we were like not limiting our opportunity to be successful and the funny thing was is that all that hard work wasn't really paying off yeah because yeah. people were still like mm, i'm good on a sandwich well, like you know you just can't make enough money on that product right you know we should have been charging 20 dollars for that sandwich yeah instead of 12 because you were <laughs> you were making it from the ground up yeah exactly yeah you know which so, in some places i mean i feel like that concept like in a place like portland where you you lived in portland too which sure. is where i'm from but it's like you you lived there for a little while too and worked do you want some of this oh yeah, 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 yeah. this is for you um and a beautiful gore cast mug right i just got those i'm Hell stoked yeah. on them um but like in a place like like it is different in different markets because I feel like that whole like concept sounds right up the the Portland alley or like in a lot of different places you know what I mean it would yeah. people would be stoked to pay you know fifteen bucks for a sandwich with the, they bake their own bread what you would yeah. think you would think that all that would make sense but s sometimes I feel like I don't know they, I'm not a restaurant owner but you would you would know better than I would but it's like sometimes it seems like the customer doesn't certain certain places they don't care about. You know those little things yeah. where, where you think they would i mean you know you have to understand your market and the people you're catering to yeah. um and then also i just feel like we were probably a little ahead of the curve when it comes to these types of sandwiches mm -hmm. i mean there wasn't anybody in austin really doing that and now you know 10 15 years later um you see people selling 17 18 sandwiches right here in austin i think Things have changed. People have become more understanding. The city has grown. You have folks coming from all over the country that are looking mm -hmm. for good sandwiches. So I think it was a combination of us being just a little ahead of the curve um, and not really quite understanding the, the, the makeup of the market at the time, mm -hmm. you know. And then it's, it was just hard. Like we couldn't. It required a bunch of people to make these damn sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> so you're waking up one, you know, sometimes and you're like, "Why the hell are we doing this?" Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was it was crazy. I mean, it was a very like loved menu that me and you know my former partner, or my you know my partner Brandon, we put together, and it was like our ode to like the sandwich. Like I right. I love a good sandwich, mm -hmm. but I wanted to make it like a chef would for his friends. If like you're inviting the boys over to watch. Right. It. Super Bowl, for instance, like mm -hmm. yesterday, and you're a chef and you put a lot of love and respect into the food. Like, well, what kind of sandwich would I make for the people I care about? Right. That was what Noble was. It was an expression of the things I love. But as a chef, you know, we have a real bad habit of making things way too fucking hard. Yeah. Like we we dig down and say, this is a great sandwich. How can we make this more difficult? It's like the painter's dilemma. Somebody just told me about that. Have you heard of that? No. Nah. It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like when I'm editing a photo or something or editing a video. You know, it's like you're I'm sitting there tweaking the smallest little thing because it just doesn't look right. Like I feel like it could look better, or I feel like it could look just oh, yeah, a little totally. bit better. You know what I mean? And it's like, is anyone gonna notice this but me? No. Probably not. No. You know what I mean? But but still, then I'll be like, oh, fuck it, and I'll just scrap the whole thing and yeah. restart it. You know what I mean? And start from scratch, and it's like, but, yeah, that exists within food, too. Yeah, it does. I mean, yeah. you know, take, for instance, our mustard. We were aging mustard seeds, grinding our own, like, <laughs> so Creole-style mustard, and you know what? Nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> I care. That sounds cool, I, but, yeah. I care. You, you care. But from a customer standpoint, I could have bought, like, a nice like, can of, like, Grey Poupon. Right. You know, yeah. and slathered it on there with some, 
you know, Hellman's Mayo, and nobody would have known the difference. Right. And it would have been way easier. It would have required less steps and less time and money invested into the sandwich. But isn't that almost kind of why it's like at at that level of art, it's like we you do shit for we do shit for ourselves. Yeah. You well, know you what do. I mean? It's like and so it's like it's it's for you. You did the mustard for you, John. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you still have to pay the bills, man. That's true. And you don't want to kill yourself making mustard. <laughs> For some like misguided like I'm gonna die on this hill today because yeah. I only serve my own homemade mustard <laughs> and, and you're thinking that matters and right. everybody's like, dude, you don't care. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, you the mu- you're like, how's the mustard? And they're yeah. like, I mean, it's fine. It's perfectly fine. Yeah, and you're like, do you have any Frenches? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're like, I put my my lifeblood into yeah. that fucking mustard. So it was just a tough like we we built a really difficult restaurant to run. It was mm-hmm. great early on when it was small. And niche, and we were doing like, you know, 75, 80 customers a day. Um, but to like reach like long term goals, like maybe wanting to retire, or be able to afford to buy a new car every once in a while, mm-hmm. and put your kids through college, just like basic, like middle class, like values. Yeah. Um, if we were going to make that kind of money, we were going to have to grow it because there just wasn't enough volume. Yeah. And that was the dilemma we were in from day one. It's like, we're not making enough money here, so we need to expand this, create more volume. Mm-hmm. And by expanding it, the menu is just far too difficult to expand easily. Yeah. And I was too young and maybe too prideful to recognize that and didn't take the um, the steps and actions to change that, to make it more scalable. Yeah. So if you, I guess, what did you learn from that? that you brought into like, because there's certain things like with my first business that I, that failed, you know, mm-hmm. it was like a weed farm that we had that failed. I was like, there's certain things that I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to do that again yeah, that way. Totally. And so it's like, what were some of those things that you took when you started interstellar that you were like, I'm not going to, we're not going to do this, that we're not going to make the mustard. Sure. You know what I mean? That we're not going to do, we're not going to make our own bread or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, and you guys do stuff still. You make, you still make oh, yeah. your own tortillas. You make all your, you know. I mean, our commitment to, to scratch cooking at Interstellar is, you know, unrivaled when it comes to other barbecue mm-hmm. restaurants. I mean, we're very serious about our food. But I'm, I also reevaluated the menu and looked at it very practically and said, you know what? There's got to be a better way to run a restaurant. Mm-hmm. So, but when we kind of came to the end of Noble, at least for me, when I was ready to move on. Um, what did that look like, I guess, before before you... Uh, you know, it, it it really sucks. Like it's just slow. Like I mean, let people know because I know what it, what it looks like with yeah. my own business. But like when, when it was coming, when you knew that the end was near for that, yeah. like what, what, why, why did you know that? Well, I mean, the, we just weren't doing the volume we needed to. The cost of running a business in Austin goes up every year. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's just built into the, it's just built into this economy here. It's like it's always getting more expensive here in Austin for everybody, not just business people. Um, So costs are going up, profits are going down. I'm not happy. Nobody's really happy at that restaurant because it's- You're not not, inspired anymore. I'm not inspired. You know, the ownership's not happy. The management's not happy. The staff's not happy. Everybody's not happy. It's very obvious. Nobody really wants to say it because nobody's, nobody wants to give up on something you've put 10 years of your life into, you know? And the employees at that point too, because it was, it was kind of, I'm guessing with the, like any small business, it was like a grassroots thing. So they were like all throwing their, you know, their heart, heart and soul into, into it too. Right. (laughs) No. (laughs) Uh, yeah, no, no, Uh, (laughs) not all of them. Maybe. No, that romantic version of a restaurant (coughs) where everybody is a hundred percent committed is, is a unicorn. It's a Hollywood. It's the bear. It's a unicorn. Yeah. And, and, and that's okay. It, it, yeah. They don't have to be. It's not their business. Right. Um, but what they do pick up on and what they tend to also like uh, portray and, and you know, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but, you know, the kind of vibes you're putting out there as the owner and as the manager it is picked up by the staff and they express it trickles down yeah Yeah. it it trickles down so we were just at this phase like we were in this restaurant um, financially didn't make sense for us anymore Um, from a lifestyle standpoint didn't make sense you know my wife was like hey you're gonna have a heart attack if you don't chill out Mm -hmm. Um, so at that point I was like I have to make a change and part of that whole process was like all right so you know if you're smart and I'm not saying I'm smart, but 
you know, <laughs> if you have any intelligence, if you look at a failed project, it, it would be wise to like analyze it and say, hey, why do I think this went so poorly? Like, right. what did I do wrong here? And that's, you know, humbling to look at something you put so much effort into and say, gosh, we got a lot of it wrong. Yeah, it didn't work. So yeah, didn't what, work. what do we do wrong? Yeah. We thought we we thought we were killing it. Yeah. So I had to really like reevaluate what was important to me. Mm -hmm. And if I was going to take another stab at a restaurant, um, what could I do to make it more sustainable for my life? Um, where it wouldn't kill me from the stress mm -hmm. and could I run a better restaurant that had um, a better um, culture and atmosphere and try to surround myself with the kind of people that I would like to be around if I'm not ever gonna make a lot of money I want to pay my bills it's a job yeah you know it's my job but the, the hang better be good then. yeah so if that's gonna be the case then the hours need to be right and then the people around me need to be right too. Because mm -hmm. these are the people you choose to surround yourself with. Right. You know, that was my being the owner, the boss, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's one of the privileges you have is you get to decide who do you let in those doors. And um, that's who you're going to spend sometimes 40, 60, 80 hours a week with. Mm -hmm. You know, more than you see your kids a lot of times. Right. So, like, get some decent people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, at least people you like. Yeah. Yeah, you, you've done a good job of cultivating a good oh. environment there. It's it's very chill, and, and but also everybody's dr pretty driven and yeah. worked. We try to find people that are, you know, that care about what they're the the what they're putting into the food, and we do, and that resonates. I think when we you do. when you eat there. But that took time to get to that point too. It wasn't yeah. like we just like oh we made these mistakes. Let's turn the page and now it's all fixed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it took. I'm still learning today on how to be a better um, a person and a better owner and a better chef um, and so it was a it was a learning process like I quickly identified what I didn't like about my previous restaurant mm -hmm. it was took more time to figure out well how do I fix those problems like how do I make it a better place yeah. and that was a learning curve you know because mm -hmm. I was I came up from restaurants where you know old school places where attitude was like hey if you don't like the job get the hell out of here you right. don't listen to me you're fired you know stuff getting thrown around being asked to do you know dumb things like going cleaning chef's you know motorcycle or <laughs> clean the alleyway Jeez, really for somebody hazing and full of bravado and mm -hmm. you, you don't like that stuff uh not you anymore. don't even you don't even watch the bear because uh, no. you don't you you won't you don't like it no i think it's uh i mean it's a it seems like it's a great show. People love it. Right. You're getting tons of awards. Mm -hmm. It's obviously well written. You've got Maddie Matheson involved into it. I think it probably does give people an idea of what the toxic work culture restaurants uh, can be. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel like it also glamorizes it to an extent. Mm -hmm. and although maybe the focus of the show has changed. Uh, my first watch, I was like, dude, that place sucks. <laughs> yeah. like, I don't want to work would, there. <laughs> I would hate to work with those people. They're all assholes. Mm -hmm. They're, they treat each other poorly. Everything's a big cock duel. You know, it's like my dick's bigger than yours. I'm a better chef than you. Mm -hmm. It's like all this stuff that just, like, I, I just, I was no longer attracted to that. I used to think that was really cool in the 90s when I was working in restaurants, reading Bourdain about rock star chefs and, you know, bad attitudes and partying and having a great time. Um, that doesn't work for me as like a guy who's like almost 50 and has kids and, just wants right. to enjoy life. Well, and you're pretty committed to just from being around you in the restaurant and and uh, and the way that you run it. It's like you're pretty committed to making it a. I'm sorry, does it suck? Oh, I'm, no. not, I'm not good. Oh. At, I'm not good at nailing the. I'm, I'm enjoying the. I'm not good at nailing the like grounds to yeah. water ratio <laughs> in the French press. It's hard for me. Yeah, that's tough. It's tough. Um, we just wing it. But uh, you want to you want to run an environment that's that's chill. Yeah. In the, in the in those restaurants, and I mean as chill as a busy restaurant can be. Sure. But but you're you're pretty committed to like making sure everybody's respecting each other and not yelling at each other. I don't you don't hear people yelling in the kitchen back then. No, really, we've really you know? changed our mantra. Um, yeah. You know the the previous restaurant was seven days a week, three turns. Mm -hmm. We worked all the holidays. We were never off. The new restaurant I deliberately chose Wednesday through Sunday, lunchtime only. Mm -hmm. um, I was gonna take my days off. Yeah. I was gonna have my nights off with my family. That's just was going to the way it was going to be moving forward. And you spent too many long nights in the in the kitchen. And yeah, just too many, stuff. just too many hours. I mean, literally, there was a stretch when we were doing catering. Um, 
where I physically ran myself down so much that at the end of the last catering that we did over a four day stretch, and I was working probably 20, 22 hours each day. I was sleeping in the office. Um, you know, we were, we were running at a skeleton crew. We had nobody there. I had these commitments I had to do because I had to pay bills and I had signed contracts. So I'm physically working 20 to 22 hours a day, sleeping for an hour and a half in the office. I hadn't gone home in three days. Did our last wedding, which was an hour and 45 minutes outside of Austin near Fredericksburg. And at the end of that shift, I could barely walk because my feet hurt so bad. Yeah. That was physically, like, painful. It took me probably a week to physically start feeling better again. So that's kind of the work I was putting into mm -hmm. running that restaurant. And so when I was done, I was like, there has to be a better way. So we went Wednesday through Sunday, lunch only, closed on Mondays and Tuesdays. And that gave me a life. That gave the people that wanted to work with me a life. They could go home and see their girlfriend or their boyfriend or hang out with their dog. They had two days off to chill and decompress mm -hmm. from the restaurant. There was like a lot of positive. The whole team, that. too. Yeah, like everybody. The, pretty much the whole team. Everybody gets two days off Yeah, in a row, usually, unless they choose to split their days. And I allow them to do that because if it makes them happy. They want more money. We should yeah. let them be happy. Sure. Um, so that was the starting point for the, the flip. And I told my wife, it's like, look, if it doesn't make money this way, that's fine. We'll move on. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll reboot life and pursue something else. But um, the early signs were good, and it was it was nice to be in the restaurant again. Oh, so the, 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 it was enjoyable to be. The clouds, the dark clouds kind of cleared a little bit. Yeah, totally. I mean, and, you know, I started to get rest again. And yeah. my staff that we had managed to build around with our new, like, parameters when it comes to hiring um, were happy to be there, too. So it was a good starting point. And that's, that's where we – had the room and the bandwidth and the, the time to start thinking about, all right, well, how can we make this a better place to work at too? Like, so you really, you, you really reworked it from like the, the inside out. Oh, sure. It wasn't, it wasn't just like, we're changing the food and the menu. Yeah. It was like, we're changing fucking everything about how we do this. Everything. Uh, we li awesome. I literally burned it to the ground and said that restaurant that I ran for 10 years, yeah. I hated it. I didn't like it. I didn't want to be there. It's amazing that you were that you're still that you were able to do it in the same place cuz I feel like for me like I think about I think about that warehouse where we had that grow mm -hmm. and I think about how I never want to see that place again. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I mean I and just, and, I, I, and I couldn't imagine yeah. like having to go back in there and just do it do it do it differently because there's so much beef attached to that place with me sure you know what i mean and you gotta get a shaman in there and burn, sage. <laughs> burn some sage or you something know. exactly is that what you guys did <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> burn I mean, some lot some post oak in there the, the fact of the matter is is i just <clears throat> i didn't have the financial benefit <clears throat> to have an option to do it anywhere else right like, well yeah and then it, this was a bit of a hell mary too mm -hmm. i mean it's like we well, shut down a restaurant that's not making a whole lot of money for a month and you have to buy new equipment, you know, barbecue Test pits, food. change the, the paint scheme a little bit, get some different equipment, rearrange the service area. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of money for a reboot. I couldn't really leave that space and start over anywhere else. Right. If it was going to be successful, it had to happen there. It was. Just, it's just cool to me that you were able to flip everything around to where you did like to be back yeah. there. I think well, that's cool, and that's probably pretty rare. Yeah, I, I mean, and it has a lot to do with the culture. You know, that's the uh, right now. The thing that's most important to me as a, a restaurateur and a chef um, is culture. Um, I've worked really hard to learn food and I still am very passionate about it. And we talk food all the time. Um, but I've discovered that none of the food uh, matters if the culture isn't right. And if you don't have the right culture, customer service is going to be off. There's going to be no hospitality. People aren't going to be happy being there. So that's been my, my goal. And the more I get into it, uh, the more I realize that this was really what I should have been doing all the time. It was mm -hmm. like really like building better environment and, and, and a better place to be. And that was the big thing that when I analyzed it was like, why am I not like thrilled to be around these folks? And it's like, right. well, it's because they're not happy. And it's because you weren't happy. And I wasn't happy. And you weren't getting, you weren't rested yeah. and, and, and you weren't being creative anymore or. So when we flipped that space and we flipped that menu and decided this is, this is the way, this is where we're going. 
um, I also said, all right, um, who are we going to work with? And I had the good fortune to, of course, to have my, you know, my partner, Leslie. Mm -hmm. um, she was on board. You know, she's permanent. She doesn't quit. <laughs> <laughs> she's stuck with you. Yeah. And, and, and she's a badass. She, she is. Uh, she works really hard, and um, she cares deeply about the restaurant and the food and the people. Um, so I knew she was on board. And then um, there was two other folks that came from the previous restaurant, and they were people that um, – I trusted. I had known for a really long time. They were a couple of the folks that I was happy to work with. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, Warren or War Dog, War Dog, and um, Ray. Both of them came on board, and they were like, "I sat them down. It's like, look, here's the deal. Here's what we're gonna do. Um, you know, it's gonna be tough. Mm -hmm. um, you want to join me?" And they came on board, and then we decided we need to hire a few more people. Um, but you know, I was happy to have a small team and make the menu smaller. Mm -hmm. um, keep the team tight and little and gelling really well. And then if we were able to hire more people, then maybe we could add some additional things to the menu. Sure. So the menu was really predicated by the size of the space, um, the limited knowledge I had of barbecue at that point in time, and then just having a really small core team. And I was like, well, I don't want to over, I don't want to kill us anymore. So right. how are we going to make this work for this small group? So basically, if we want to make the menu bigger, the team has to grow. Exactly. Uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna put all this crazy stress on. No. Nope. We're not because we're not. So was there ever ever times where there was things that you wanted to do with this new you know with with Interstellar when you flip when you flipped into the new business where you were like, oh, I want to do that, and you're like, ah, but I have to stick to my rules that yes. I'm setting for myself. Uh, every day. Every day. Okay. Every day. I'm still. You're still. I'm still a reforming. I'm like an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, You're a workaholic. I, I, I have to. I have to look at myself in the mirror and say, "I'm John Bates, and I like to make my life hard, and I have to reform." You know. Yeah. So when we when we flipped it and we we created the space and the menu, and there were rules that everything had to be ready for service at eleven o'clock. It had to be something that we could serve instantly, a la carte, their uh, counter style, and so no order fire things like nothing going to the kitchen, mm -hmm. no tickets, no people on a line getting yelled at by a chef no, no breakfast no breakfast no dinner no catering no weddings like we just got rid of everything and said let's just focus focus on this like core little menu mm -hmm. and try to do it really well so yeah every special or service that we now look at and i tried to adhere to this the whole way through um I, the first thing i asked myself is like can we serve this in this format mm -hmm. and can we do it well um, does it require a special person to do it? Um, you know, is it is it easily attainable? These are the things that I think about when we're putting new menu items on them or adding new services to our hospitality when people come through there. It's like, does this make sense for us? And there's so many cool things we could do in the kitchen. I got a full kitchen back there. I got, mm -hmm. like, grills and fryers and flat tops and, you know, all this space to do really rad stuff. But it makes it more stressful. Right. It changes the customer service dynamic. Um, you have to hire more people to do it. So, and you're at risk like you're at risk of also like letting quality, you know, yeah. go up and down or be inconsistent if you're adding things all the time. Well, or, you, you can be if you're if you can't handle it. That's the thing, right? Like Noble became unmanageable, couldn't mm -hmm. handle it. Um, I wasn't going to make that same mistake again. So, and you know, so we didn't offer a variety of services at Interstellar because it just didn't fit with what the rules were. It's mm -hmm. like, my rule is it has to be fit into this format. And I still catch myself thinking about, oh, how rad, how rad would it be to do all these smash burgers? Or and chicken wings. Do chicken yeah. wings, or let's, you know, do a cold smoked ribeye and chicken fry it and send it out there. Like, all the stuff that I know would, would taste great. Would kill. Yeah. I can cook really well, mm -hmm. but um, it doesn't fit with the format. Right, it, somebody's gonna suffer. Yeah, something so, something will suffer if you add these things in. So the structure that we built into it has given uh, the team and myself discipline, where we're like, we have to make it work under these confines, mm -hmm. and that's been really rewarding. And I've never operated a restaurant like that, um, and worked in a restaurant where where there were rules to like, no, we just can't do that because it doesn't fit our service model. Right, and it's just good. the the team will suffer. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, you, and it's interesting that you kind of had a, an idea that we, what if we just basically stop the, the, the negative, toxic stuff at its root 
which is like stressing out the team or you not getting rest, you know, you being a, you being an owner that is not happy, you know, it's like, what if we fix it from within? And, it, and it's, and it's kind of like every, it seems like every time you go back to that and hold strong on those rules, it seems to, it reinforces, it, it reinforces. Yeah. It seems you seem to be right about yeah. it. Yeah. And, and I wasn't like really in tune with like, with under, fully understanding the value of focusing on culture and, and negativity and positivity in the restaurant when we flipped it. I just knew I wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to be around people that I enjoyed spending time with. And that was kind of the spark that really made me think about, like, well, you know, we only want to bring in people that we want to be with. Right. That share our values. And, and that was the, the starting point for, like, me really, like, evaluating, like, well, how can I take this good feeling that I have now and, like, and work from there. And you had a hunch that I bet it's going to come, I bet it's going to come out in the food. <laughs> like I bet it's going to resonate in the food if, if, if everybody's having a generally pretty good time. Yeah. I mean, I think, it, I think it does. I mean, mm -hmm. I, when I was a younger chef, um, I worked for people, um, you know, some amazing people, uh, that told me, it's like, Hey, you need to put love into the food. And me being a young jaded chef, I was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's all technique. It's all, it's just oh, so what it's what you know. Is what what, you what the hell is love in food? It was like either you know how to execute a perfectly done steak or you don't. And like loving the steak doesn't mean you have the skills. Right. Um, but, but that's I, spoken like somebody who's not getting the message. Yeah. But when now I've changed my tune on that dramatically. And I don't know if love's the right word, but I do know that if you care about um, if you care about your staff and you treat them as such and they feel like you care and it's a job i mean you know so right. there's always a little bit of like you know it's work nobody wants to work but we have to work yeah. um you know most of us that aren't trust fund babies you know they can just mm -hmm. float around life and, and not have to worry about those things right um so if you care about them and they feel like they're cared about then they're more likely to give a little more effort on the food and the hospitality and right. that's what we do like we make food and we provide hospitality our format is barbecue but what we're really making for most people is experiences and are they enjoying those mm -hmm. and it's a lot easier to make somebody happy and give them real hospitality when you feel like the guy who's your boss isn't like on your ass all day long micromanaging the position making your job difficult right. for no reason and always giving you grief yeah. so um that's where i'm at nowadays yeah it seems like you nurture a pretty creative uh, environment too back there. Like just, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be working with you for, God, I think it's been like two years now. Yeah. Um, you were the first person to hire me. Uh, well, Evan gave me like a project, you know, you mm -hmm. and between you and Evan, you guys were the first people to believe in me when I moved here. And uh, it's a kind of an interesting story. I don't want to touch on this too, um, but uh, but it's ever since I've been back there, it's like, it's just, you know, hey, try this. You know, hey, I'm working on this thing, and and it's like, you're in you're in there in the trenches at your station, you know, cutting stuff up. You're not the omnipotent uh, restaurant owner in the shadows, you know, <laughs> that never comes in or no. whatever, you know. And do, you know, do you think you'll be you'll be in there until the you know until you can't physically anymore? Well, you know I, what I mean? Uh, I truly love what I do now. Mm -hmm. I truly love hospitality. I love running restaurants. I love. Um, seeing smiles on people's faces i love seeing smiles on my team's faces um so yeah i can't really at this point imagine doing anything else with mm -hmm. my life so yeah. i would like to i would like to do this talk can um but under but on my terms right you know where it's enjoyable but um when it comes to the the create the creative side of the food i'm still very although we have these parameters in these rules um uh, those have actually um, enhance or encourage creativity because I just don't have the ability to say, oh, I want this, 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 and this and just make it happen. Right. I want the mustard with the aged seeds yeah. and I want to do all of our own, you know, pickled things and yeah, I want yeah. to make all the bread because you're, you have, you have rules now. So I have these, I have these confinements. And so that allows us to start actually really being truly creative and thinking about like, well, how can we work with this, these these rules and still elevate our food mm -hmm. you know and not make it difficult and do you think that kind of brings a little bit down to reality you know like like it brings brings it a little bit down to like stuff that is actually possible to execute right yeah. because because you can, a lot a lot of the stuff that you know you might want to might have wanted to do with noble pig 
um, or a noble sandwich shop was, mm -hmm. you know, it's like you can technically do it all. Yeah. Right. But, but if it doesn't work, then, um, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna cost you something yeah. at well, some point. I mean, it just comes down to that old adage, just yeah. because you can, doesn't mean you should. Oh yeah. I mean, I can make whatever I want. Mm -hmm. I've put, I've studied food for, you know, 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, if you want scratch pasta, you want homemade bread, you want fine dining, you want vegan food, um, give me an hour. And, right. And I can figure out just about what you shouldn't you need. Not that you shouldn't always just that doesn't make mean everything. That should do it. Though, right. You know, um, just because one customer wants, um, you know, one item, that doesn't mean I should, oh, well, we got to start making this one item and offer it to everybody. Or just because you like something doesn't mean that it Even should go example. on. Yeah. Uh, there are lots of things I love that nobody wants to buy. What are some, what are some things that you would, that you would love to serve that you, uh, I mean, that nobody would want to so buy? So I grew up in, a, up in South Texas, mm -hmm. um, you know, backyard barbecues and grills. I love sweetbreads or mollejas. Okay. Um, they're kind of weird. They're like these weird organ meats that you grill. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're rad. They taste like bacon when you're done cooking them. Okay. I've only seen them on like chopped. Yeah. You know, like as a weird ingredient. So that's an ingredient that I would love to serve in the restaurant. But um, if the customers don't want it, there's no point. Right. You know, so a as a cook, that's the other thing you got to learn like long term, like as a young chef or aspiring cook or a restaurateur. It's like your, your palate drives the menu. Um, but you have to make sure that you allow the menu to to satisfy the customers right it's not for you yeah it's not the other way around it's not, it's not like i'm like some high and mighty chef with the chef coat on and i'm running a four-star restaurant in new york city and it's got three michelin stars and it's all about chef and you come in and you pay you know three hundred dollars for you know eight tiny portions of food right um and you know and everybody says oh what a genius um it's not like that but in the real world you know like the other right you know 99.9% .9 of restaurants in America, um, your palate drives the menu. It, it sets the standards, but you have to make sure that your palate is in tune with your customers. Right. And so if you love something, like I like salt. I love my food salty. Mm -hmm. But that's not in line with my customers. So I have to make sure I have to dial the recipes back to make them happy. Mm, you know? Yeah. And, and that's just a, a, a small example of like how you can't, make food just for you right you know there has to be up. some kind of compromise though because otherwise you you will you wouldn't come out in the like you know what you love and care about and your passion creatively wouldn't come out in the food if you just catered to the customer right, all the sure. time right yeah i mean there's so a there's a there's a balance there's a flip side to it too i mean if if you're a yes man and you you try to be a, you know you, you try to answer to every little critique then you have no vision. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is a balance. Right. But I think it's important to understand, um, you know, not only can you not let just the menu go wherever every little opinion wants it to go, there's a, there's a balance between that and you saying, I only serve the food this way because that's how I like it. Right. There's a sweet spot in the middle where you can mm -hmm. still be creative and you can still get people really excited about the food and you can still feel like it's got integrity and you're happy with it. Um, without compromising too much you just got to find that spot right it's hard to put a, your finger on where that's at but you have to understand you're kind of always searching for that spot i yeah. feel like right it, it moves yeah the goal post is constantly moving yeah <laughs> yeah great 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 way to figure it out right right i guess it's a super bowl inspired uh analogy <sighs> metaphor um so what Explain to people who don't understand like Texas barbecue and haven't been here, haven't been to Interstellar, because there's I think there's a handful that you know just aren't from here and they sure. haven't been that watch. Um, like, why is Interstellar different? We'll get to the list and <clears throat> all that stuff and in that story, mm -hmm. but like, you wanted Interstellar to be different, yeah, from the start, yeah. from the get go, because you're a chef. You're not a you're not a Lockhart barbecue guy from the barbecue world. You yeah. didn't grow up, you know, you're not a, you're not a, a, one of the, you know, like the children of Terry Blacks or whatever, you know, Blacks barbecue or, or Louis Mueller. You're not like a classic barbecue guy born and raised. No. <clears throat> and so you wanted to put a little bit of your sauce into your creative juice into the menu. But I, I know you've expressed this to me before, and I just picked it up since I've been here, um, you know, and, and seen the, the barbecue world. Mm -hmm. People people sometimes 
it's it's a fine line uh um, you're kind of on thin ice when you're trying to change barbecue sometimes right oh, yeah. like when you're when you're trying to fuck with the holy trinity and of sausage and and what is it sausage ribs brisket you know what i mean yes. when, when you when you're starting to tweak that it's easy to get on people's bad side like you're mm -hmm. you're ruin you're messing with barbecue yeah right well which sounds ridiculous to say to people but texas barbecue is it's a it's a thing it's, it's a, a thing it's a thing yeah, it, yeah it's a thing it's a lifestyle it's a culture Mm -hmm. um, it's it it's, would be like me walking into um, an amazing bagel shop in New York and telling them, "Hey, we should change this up." Like, yeah, you guys don't really know what you're doing with bagels. <laughs> I guess that, that's a good. And they look it. at me like, "Get this dumb Texan out of here!" Like he doesn't right. know, <laughs> he doesn't know the first thing about bagels. Right. Um, you know, Texas barbecue um, at its core is about the fire, the Trinity, which is going to be your brisket, your ribs, and your sausage. Um, it's really about the brisket, though, and it's really about serving stuff that's so good that it shouldn't require sauce. Those are kind of like the the those most basic staples. tenets of right. Texas barbecue. Um, offset pit, usually, or at least in the current form of it, um, is a part of the equation. So I decided to shut down a sandwich shop because I'm not happy with it. And I decided to open up a barbecue place in probably the most competitive barbecue market in America. Mm -hmm. And people are like, dude, you're so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> um, why are you shutting down your sandwich shop to open up another barbecue place? Well, and a sandwich shop, too. It's like something that's hard to make work. Yeah. Right. Well, and it was beloved. I mean, don't get me wrong. I right. Mean, people loved the sandwich shop. It, mm -hmm. it allowed me to do so much. There's still one in the airport, yeah, right? Yeah, there's still okay. one floating around here. Okay. Um, it got my name on the scene in Austin. It allowed us to do all sorts of things. So there was some benefits, mm -hmm. um, especially early on. But people were really confused as to why I was shutting down a beloved sandwich shop to open up a barbecue place in Austin, Texas. You know, the home of Aaron Franklin. Right. Um, Terry Black's. Uh, Mickleway. And you got Lockhart right down the road. Right. You got the Mueller's out in Taylor, and they're like, "We don't need more barbecue, dude." And I was like, mm. "But I have something to offer. I think. Yeah. I think I can put my touch on it and maybe honor the center of the play, the barbecue, the way it's supposed to be. But maybe add some other things to it that can make it a little fun." You know, I hate that whole thing. the the whole That whole idea with anything, not just with restaurants, but like with starting a podcast. Like why why would you do that? You know what I mean? What because I want to. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I'm because for some reason I'm driven to do it. Yes. And I and I and it there's something inside me that tells me I have to. Why would you start a metal band when Metallica is out? When all these bands you know what I mean? When when music is saturated. And I came up a long I think a long time ago or like a couple of years a couple of years back, I had this thought that that market saturation doesn't really exist. Like I think it's something that people say to thwart the competition mm -hmm. to get people to to gatekeep and to get people to not try yeah, totally. to not be in in you know they they want it all for themselves it's a feast or famine type thing and um it, it, i think that market saturation gives you it's it's just an opportunity to stand out yeah you know what i mean and and obviously you can look at numbers and see you know what markets have a lot of people in them doing you know there's a lot of podcasts out there sure None of them are me, you know what I mean. Doing you my bring thing, your, I'm bringing bring my own, take. yeah, my own take on things. And there's a lot of metal bands out there, you know. What I mean? There's a lot of barbecue places out there. It's it's like if you approached things with that mentality, nobody would ever do anything ever. Oh yeah, I mean, and so I just that's why it's as it's soon as people are like, there's a you know a million bars. Why do you want to? I want to I want to open a I want to open a bar one day. Like I want to be a partner in a mm -hmm. bar, it's like a hang, like a. Uh, you know, like a cosmic coffee type place someday yeah. with, and, and so, I and mean, I've expressed this to you before and I don't know the first thing about that, but I'm around a lot of people. I have a lot of resources. I have a lot of friends that know a lot more than me that I could learn from, you know what I mean? it's like, and that's a lot of people be like, why, you know, why would you do that? There's so many of those places. It's like, well, you know, I've done a lot of things that I probably shouldn't have did because there's a lot of people doing them, <laughs> but I'm still doing them and yeah. I'm doing all right. You know, why would you pick up a camera? Everybody's there's everybody's got a camera everybody's in their pocket. Phone. Everybody's got a phone. Yeah, but there's still value to that, you know. There is. I mean, and I think you're right. It is a certain sense of gatekeeping. Um, I just also think that in a dynamic market, uh, full of creative folks and driven folks and people that have visions and they know where they want to go, 
what you know they always find their way to where they want to be mm-hmm. um, I just also think talent and dedication um, can you know get you above the crowd uh, if you're willing to work hard it can get you above the crowd um, just finding that right mix uh, to all bring you together is you know the tough thing to put your hand on mm-hmm. but yeah I mean far too often people want to tell you no you can't do that right oh that's dumb you can't do that that's a bad idea and if you let that drive your life then you're always going to be stuck you know in the same spot and wondering gosh what would have happened if i had at some point you have to shut out the noise and just fucking go for it and i think people who are in the creative space understand that more intuitively than other folks it's like Sometimes you just have to do it because you know, you know, I like this. And I think if I make this the way I like it, some people might enjoy it and there might be value in that. And it's hard like, because we live in this society where people want to, a lot of times want to shut you down. Right. As soon as they find out you want to do something different, they're like, oh, no, 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 no. That's a terrible idea. You can't do that. And imagine if, if, if you, um, like, were worried every step of the way with everything you did about pissing off barbecue people. You would you would never be Interstellar. Well, yeah, you the wouldn't, Interstellar wouldn't exist. You wouldn't cook anything but sausage and ribs and brisket. Right, and it's like in everything that makes you guys you is basically a risk that you've taken at some sure. point. Sure. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, and that's just how I've always approached life um, when it comes to the creative stuff, and especially with food. I think, you know, I think it's important with barbecue because it runs so deep in Texas that you have to understand the food. Mm-hmm. Um, at its core to respect and, it to respect it and know what the deal is that way you can add your contribution to it because as much as I love barbecue um, and it's it's enjoyed this amazing spotlight for the last 20 years and that's because of, um, a lot of people work really hard um, creating the culture and the food and then you had folks like Aaron Franklin come in and really introduce it to a whole new audience across the the country and to the world so we've been in this golden age of barbecue and it's great we're all enjoying it but if it's going to remain remain relevant on the national food scene and remain relevant internationally um, it's really important that the food continues to evolve it has to feel like texas barbecue it needs to look like texas barbecue it needs to taste like texas it needs to eat like texas it needs to eat like texas barbecue but it also needs to have like some fresh things added to it new ingredients um you know, new perspectives, new sides, new sides, new techniques that you can fold into it and say, this makes sense on this tray of barbecue. These mm-hmm. pieces of pork belly belong next to this piece of brisket. And you can add new things to it and continue to push it forward. And I feel like that's one of my biggest roles now is like adding to the conversation of barbecue, you know, and adding our little stamp to it and help mm-hmm. it move on down the road to the next version of it. But also kind of skirting that line of like, Dressing it up too much because be- yeah. because I've noticed and I couldn't tell you I probably wouldn't drop a name if even if I could remember who it was or what it was, but I've had things recently where I'm like, oh, this is what John was talking about where you're 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 fancying it up, mm-hmm. you're you're dressing up barbecue yeah. too much, and you kind of I'm like, oh, that's what it is, you know what I mean? Because because there's there, you know, you you might think that. I'm sure there's a couple salty people that have thought that about, you know, your peach tea oh, yeah. pork belly or whatever, you you know, all the little things. That, it's basically you take each thing and and you, you tweak it just a little bit and yeah. add a little, you throw jalapeno in the slaw it's a fine or whatever. Line. It's a fine line. I can't tell you how many people walked into my restaurant and said, man, your sides are weird. <laughs> like, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean they're weird? It's like mac and cheese and slaw, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but it's yeah. like the little it's Gouda mac and cheese. Yeah, it's a little change. It's like adding Gouda or making the potato salad with mayo and new potatoes instead of, you know, russet potatoes and yellow mustard, um, adding a fresh side like a tomato zucchini salad. Um, they're not really that different from other barbecue sides, but they're slightly different. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens when you open up a place in a barbecue mecca. They're like, well that's different right therefore it's weird you know and this is early on too so i'm right. like I'm like ask my wife's like hey are the sides really that weird yeah. <laughs> am, I, am, I, am, am i am i fucking crazy am here? i out of touch here because yeah. i thought they were pretty basic right um, you know and now you you're know, like because i'd love to i'd love to turn it up a notch yeah, i'd like, love to have yeah. some more fun yeah uh, or but, but you're trying to you're st- trying to stay true to it at the same trying. time um, so yeah it's it's an interesting road because um you know you do 
you're working in this space where people are very passionate about the food. Right. And that's one of the things I love most about being in the barbecue space is like how much people have worked up about barbecue. Right. They love it. Their favorite places, their expectations of what it should be. It's unlike pretty much any other their, genre of food. Their favorite pit masters. They are very passionate. And I love seeing the back and forth and the arguments about <laughs> the perfect brisket. Mm-hmm. This is the perfect barbecue place. This is the perfect. Or the methods. Yeah. Right. This is the perfect. This is how you make the perfect you know brisket because my pit master does it this way and that that's my guy i don't right. i don't ever deviate from my guy He's it's my serious team. dude people from t- that aren't from texas or don't live they here, don't get it they don't they yeah. can't understand it's it's life or death yeah and then they wonder why we love to fight like tooth and nail over things like beans and chili it's right because you know we're from texas and the food here the, our regional foods that we hold dear it it matters mm-hmm. you know people get pissed off when you <laughs> when you when you mess with their food <laughs> yeah exactly you know, just sure. don't like it and especially like, Texas. boy i don't know what the hell you're doing there but i don't like it how dare you put beans in my it's chili like, you haven't even tasted it so like, where do you stand on the be- i know where you stand but tell oh. tell us where you stand on beans and chili and meat well, and chili. there is no beans and chili there's no beans and chili yeah it isn't chili if it's got beans in it now you can make an amazing stew that has some ground meat or some cued meat and some beans and some dried chilies and things in there and and and, and really enjoy it lovely stew but you can't call it chili it's not chili it's not chili don't call it chili yeah. and and i and, and when people argue with me about this i just pull out like the examples from the beverage world like there are rules about bourbon every bourbon's a whiskey but not every whiskey is a bourbon and the world has accepted the definition of a proper bourbon, just like champagne comes from the Champagne region of France. Mm-hmm. You have lots of bubbly wine from all over the world, but you can only have champagne if it's from one area and it adheres to certain rules. Same deal with chili. <laughs> you want to put beans in your chili? That's fine. Just don't call it chili. Yeah. Just be. Just, just know that that's not chili. You're just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 Interstellar, you you're you're deciding to skirt the line, and. Did you run into problems at the beginning with with people like not 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 being on board? No, not so much. I mean, like I mentioned early on, we did have people come in and think that it was, you know, different. Mm -hmm. Um, Say things like your sides are weird or, you know, why do you have, um, you know, peach glaze on this pork belly? Uh, You know, there was a little bit of that. But for the most part with our restaurant, we found from early on is like, if you can at least get them to try it, nine times out of ten, they leave happy. Right. And you hopefully have introduced them to something new that they can say, hey, you know, this was pretty good. Right. Yeah, I, I might go back. I might tell my friends to go check this place out. So, it, you know, we did get a little bit of that early on. But, um, you know, um, we just would open up. And as long as there was more people there the next day, I figured we would be doing the right thing. Yeah. So let's talk about the list a little bit without going too much into it but sure. um so we've talked about this with like sawyer when sawyer lewis was on uh uh was on the podcast like just kind of the gravity of the list but maybe you could explain what it is to people um and then kind of how it affected you guys because when i first met you on one of my trips here i think it was 2021 mm-hmm. uh march of 2021 we came um and it was it was slow at the restaurant Right. Yeah. And we could have just been a slow day, but I think I came two or three different times across a couple different uh, months and it was it was it was like pretty it was pretty slow. Yeah. So I mean, it's like how was stuff looking before before the list came out? Like how was how was it? How was the future for Interstellar looking, I guess, before before everybody knew how good the food was? Well, we opened up at a really interesting time. Um, we opened up in uh, February 19. So we had about a year before everybody flipped COVID, out yeah. and COVID shut down the world. Um, during that first year, we saw really positive things, but we were pretty quiet. Mm-hmm. Um, we were paying our bills. I was happy. Team was happy. Um, we would cook, you know, a dozen briskets for a busy banging day. And by 1245, one o'clock, it'd be pretty quiet and so we were just kind of existing as a small neighborhood barbecue joint. but you were stoked because yeah. i was happy because you were rested the crew was the crew was awesome yes. you were happy again yeah. yes i was happy right and what i had told my 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 wife told leslie um was happening we were paying our bills and i was enjoying work again 
And if that's all this was going to be. Just a humble shot. I was content with that. Right. You know, it, it felt good. Now, that didn't mean we didn't try to always make the food better mm -hmm. and always try to improve hospitality. Because when you're running a restaurant in a dynamic city like Austin, if you're not continuing to work on your craft, you're going to end up falling behind. I didn't want to go out of business. So we were always trying to improve things. Um, the COVID hits. We spend that year. And, you know, that's probably a, a conversation for later other days. Um, we get through that and we get into the spring of 21. Um, and the restaurant's open again. We got people in the dining room and we're serving food. So that'd be when I was there. Uh, probably about that when I first that. met you and first went there. And about, you know, as far as volume of sales goes, it had kind of returned back to normal post-COVID. And mm -hmm. we were just kind of doing our thing. Um, you know, so that's where we were. We were happy. Uh, working on the food, trying to do our best. Um, our food has changed a lot from when we first opened up to where we're currently at. Um, but so that's where we were. That's where we're existing. And then it, we know, like I, I, living in Texas, there is one thing that really can like catapult your restaurant into the, the larger scene where people are aware of it. And that's uh, the Texas Monthly Top 50 Barbecue List. Um, it's... Um, a publication, you know, for folks that aren't here and aren't familiar with it, Texas Monthly puts out this list every four years, and they take on a very challenging uh, task of trying to rank something so contentious as barbecue. It's crazy. For the state of Texas. Yeah. And they do their best job, and they send out a bunch of people to go try food, and they somehow cobble together a list. And on that list are the legends, the people that had built this food, the, the you know, the, the, the Mueller's. Um, Wayne Mueller, um, Aaron Franklin, um, John Lewis is now in the Carolinas, has worked in restaurants that were on this list. Uh, you got uh, Miss Tootsie and the snowman out at Snows. Uh, like, have all, all these guys have always been at the top of the list. They're the legends. Mm -hmm. So everybody in barbecue knows the list and understands that if you can make that list, um, it will make your life a little bit easier. Like, right. you'll get a little bit of traction. You don't have to worry about people lining up or not yeah, yeah. i mean not as much not I as mean, much uh, i would figured if if we were ever blessed enough to get on the list that maybe the restaurant would stay full to like two <laughs> instead of one you know we might get a few more people in the door and it might make it a little bit easier to, to purchase some new equipment or, or hire give, give raises out to people or, or give a raise you know just just like you know i'd like the place to be a little bit busier and if we were lucky enough to make that list it, that might happen so that list is really important. Um, it's it, not your average list. No, it's not. It, I, I thoroughly believe that it's, um, you know, in American food, you have things like Michelin stars and um, your local James Beard, local people rating you and Beard awards and um, all various ways that people try to rank restaurants and show the the greater public that this is a good place to go to. Um, of all those lists and awards, I think right now, at least for the last you know 15 years or so, the Texas Monthly uh, Barbecue List is probably the most powerful list that you can get on in American food. Really? Like it can take a restaurant from nowhere and pluck them out and turn them into a huge success. It has that kind of power. It has staying power. Um, so everybody in barbecue knows you need to try to do good. Right. On that list. But there's a caveat there because, like, okay, you get that list, and then, and I mean, I'm sure you'll go into the, you're about to go into this, but mm -hmm. then you get hit with, with a tsunami. It, and you have to weather the storm and keep that food, keep that food as close to what it was when you made the list, you know, every yeah. day. Because, because you get hit with a crazy wave of, of business and you have to learn how to how yeah. to f manage that i mean it could be it depends on where you land on that list too. sure i mean the 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 results of that also while um can be very different depending on where you sure. land on that list because only the top 10 is ranked okay and the other 40 are just listed as they're just on there. on the group of great places to go visit um so yeah it, it it can really change things for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I will say this too. I mean, the list is important. Um, it's not the be all end all though. I mean, there are lots of great barbecue restaurants in Texas that make amazing food that are not on anybody's list that are very successful because they focus on their customers and their food. And their staff. Yeah, and their staff. And so it, you can't 
cooked to necessarily be on the list. You need to cook to take care of your customers and the people that live in your area, first and foremost. And to be true to yourself to as be a true chef, to yourself, as an owner. And yeah. to be successful long term, I think it's very important that you can't let the list dictate um, how you run your business and the food you right. choose to serve. Um, you just have to understand that that list matters though mm -hmm. so it's this balance like it's kind of like the like the doing stuff you know for the customer yeah trying to make the customer happy and make yourself happy we were talking about that weird gray area that you have to kind of always search for exactly it's kind of another one of those yeah or or like you know being in some other field like sports or music it's like you want to make great like lifetime achievement lists but you still have to focus on you and what you're doing in the moment mm -hmm. you can't like let that dictate where how you, you make your music. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So this list is important. We all get it. I'm running my restaurant to the best of my ability, um, trying to make people happy. And, you know, then one day that all changed. Yeah. So what was <laughs> what was that whole, like, experience like? So you guys, y y I heard, I've heard from folks that you kind of find out, like, the day before. Or they, they give you a little bit of lead time so you can get ready for the crazy. Yeah, get ready. Yeah, yeah, that you can get crazy, ready for it to get crazy in there. So uh, we know going into 21 that that's when people are going to be checking out your restaurant. For the list. For the list. So the best thing you can do is make sure that you are consistent in your food. And you almost have to act like it's not happening, right? Well, you have to because you don't know who they are. I mean, unless it's Daniel, everybody knows who Daniel is. Sure. If you don't know who Daniel, if you don't know Daniel's in your restaurant, um, you're not doing your job. <laughs> 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 because uh, he doesn't like hide his sure. face. He he thoroughly believes. That I really want to get him on here, but you should. He definitely believes in the idea that once the barbecue is cooked, there's really no like you can't run into the kitchen and remake it. Right. Like you can't. Yeah. It's not like like when Ramsey goes into those uh, in that the yeah. reality shows and they're like, oh, Ramsey's here. We got to make it really good yeah. for him. Yeah. If your so. briskets are hammered, they're all hammered. Right. If they're missed season, they're all missed season. So you can because you made them you made them six hours ago yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So you can dig around in there and try to find the best one of the bad ones you made. But um <laughs> You just you kind of got what you got, right? So I always tell my guys, look, just make sure that we're focusing on quality, consistency, and you treat everybody in the restaurant like they're, you know, a food reviewer. Sure. So we go into that time, and that's what we're doing. Just trying to be consistent. Um, you know, you kind of watch what's going on, and you see that it's getting close for the list to kind of be made. And Daniel starts bouncing around, checking out restaurants, and. Uh, he shows up in our restaurant in the later part of the summer mm -hmm. in January in twenty one, and I was like, "Oh man, we might like be considered." Is he the great decider? Well, no. It's how a group. does it work? It's a group from I, they vote on it. From what I understand now, after the process, I listened to a few podcasts where he talks about how they decide this. Okay, and they send out a bunch of people all over the state to go try the barbecue first. Yeah, and from that series of visits i believe they put scores on everything and that kind of is the first cut okay and then apparently other people come through and then if daniel hasn't been to your restaurant in a while he shows up as well okay. so i think what happens is, is they all get scored and that pretty much kind of lines it kind of lines it up and i think i don't know if daniel said this but i kind of get the feeling like he maybe makes the calls when it's like he splits he splits the hairs he splits the hairs yeah, it's okay. a tie like every restaurant in this section all scored the same thing he has has the un, the unenviable job of deciding all right well how do i rank these three because they all right. got the same score which like you said in before you started talking about this it really it, that is what we're doing here with the splitting list hairs. is splitting hairs because yeah. at the, that level of the top 50 it's just so and people who aren't even on the list and yeah. like there's some people like like kyle like i'm like how is kyle not on the list? you know what i mean like yeah. Like, like it does some stuff just doesn't make sense. Sometimes I'm like, okay, well, you, they can't give them all to Austin. Yeah, you can't. know what I mean? They, they have to spread it around. It's the Texas list, not the Austin list. I mean, they, but, they say that the list is the list and they don't choose regions to sure. represent it. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if I quite believe that, but, um, right. you know, I get it. It's a big state, it's a lot of barbecue. Right. Um, anybody in the top 10, maybe, well, anybody in the top 10 on any given day could be making the best barbecue that day in the state of Texas. Sure. Some guy in his backyard who doesn't run a restaurant may be making better barbecue that day in the state of Texas. Well, in, the, in theory, he's out there. Well, and and he'll tell you he makes better barbecue than <laughs> right. anyway. So yeah, you'll hear, you'll hear you'll it. You'll hear it. Um, or it could be a, a, a restaurant that's an up-and-comer. Um, 
you know, it, it's splitting hairs. Yeah. It's um, it's kind of a crazy job to have, yeah. I feel like. But So they do all their stuff. They do yeah. all the ranking. Daniel shows up in the restaurant. I'm, like, geeking out because I'm like, oh, man, we're going to be considered. Yeah. And that's all I wanted going into this because I be. know that it only happens every four years. Yeah. And I know we're new, and I know our food is improving every day. And, and I tell my staff and Leslie, it's like, hey, my dream would be to make this list in some fashion. The year before – or not the year before, but the time before they had put out also their top 50 and then a list of like 10 restaurants. like Honorable mentions. Honorable right? mentions or like best new places. And I was like, man, if we could make that. Yeah, that would be cool. That would be banging. Like we'd be in the magazine. People well, would also, see our name. It, it, could, it could help with business a little bit. So that sure. was our goal going into it. And also it, it's – I feel like, again, you're, you're – you're, your thought process of relaunching the restaurant from this thing that you just hated or couldn't stand to be in that restaurant anymore. And you, mm -hmm. you, your, your thought process is, is being even further reinforced. You see, you see Daniel in there mm -hmm. and things are, things are going smooth and foods, foods tasting great. People are liking it. You're paying your bills and you're happy again. Yeah. And then you, and you're like, okay, this is okay. This works. This, I was right. If I change it from within, and I focus on the, the core values of how we treat our staff and who we hire and and not overworking us with doing crazy shit that I want to do on the menu and mm -hmm. keep basically keeping yourself, you know, holding yourself down a little bit, right? Then maybe, you know, this is all going to work out for the better. And then it's like you you see Daniel in there and you're like, oh, my God, it's like it's, it's, it's happening. Yeah. So it's like you're listening. You're, you're, you're constantly being reminded that like that thought process is mm -hmm. is helping you kind of get these wins yeah you know what i mean which i think is cool just to it, hear that story it felt good it felt yeah. like we were doing the right stuff um so yeah he comes in serve him a plate of barbecue I, at that point in time i was working the cutting board every day so yeah. I, at the very least i knew that i gave him the best that plated we had, the best plating you could do the best that we had that right. day um and uh he enjoyed the food dropped by afterwards told us he had a good time they split and I was like, "All right, this is cool. Yeah, maybe, we'll, we'll see. Maybe, you right. know, maybe. maybe maybe we'll be in the maybe we'll be in the in the bottom. Yeah, maybe we'll maybe we'll make some part of that yeah, list. Make some part of that list. And so that during that phase afterwards, all my friends in the business were all like chatting about like, "Oh man, did you know? Did Daniel come visit? Um, right. You know, do you think you made the list?" And we're all just kind of like sharing notes with each other, trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, then we get the first sign that we may have done all right that uh, they called and uh, were following up on some facts fact checking like the hours of the restaurant and some stuff to put in the, pu in the yeah, publication the, yeah where we were at and i was like oh man this is cool i think we made the list i think like, we're gonna be on they there. did a fact check and then um, a couple weeks later they asked if they could send out um a photographer and i was like whoa this is crazy like they're sending a photographer yeah i'm like tell my tell leslie it's like, we definitely made the list and she's like don't think like that yeah <laughs> like don't blow it up in your head because there's no way we made the list that's I'm a like, good partner telling you <laughs> telling you not to not to get too excited and i was like we made the list she's like we didn't make the list i'm like we made the list she's like let's just be grounded mm -hmm. they come out and take pictures and i'm thoroughly convinced we're on the list right it's christmas eve for yeah, you yeah. I, it's christmas eve and i'm like man we're going to be like one of those 10 new places this is so awesome um the and, honorable mentions yeah the honorable about. mentions yeah. And so I'm really, like, I'm excited. Like, I, I feel like we've done well. And so it gets closer to the date when it drops in October. And uh, then they asked if they could do a little filming there uh, for their Texas Monthly Barbecue Club. And I was like, well, that's weird. What's going on? And I was like, then I told, then I really told Leslie, I was like, dude, we made the list. Like, we actually, like, we're in, like, the top 50, I think. And she's like, don't go there. Right. <laughs> Don't don't disappoint yourself. You're just gonna disappoint yourself, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's good. She keeps me grounded. Um, you gotta have but somebody. She like was that. cautiously optimistic at that point too. You yeah. know, we talked more. She was like, just, "Fine, we're probably." She's on like, those. "We probably made the list, but there's no way we made, you know, the top ten. We're definitely. We think we're on the list now, and let's just see what happens." So somewhere in that forty. Yeah. Yeah. So fast forward to October, and uh, it's the day of the list. Wake up in the morning and. Um, we're number two. And <laughs> the first thing Leslie said was, 
we're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, yeah, we're screwed. Yeah. Um, we need to hire some people right now. We need more. We need to call all of our people and get uh, all of our providers, get more, get more meat. Uh, yeah, it was just, it was wild. And then, you know, honestly, I, I'm very confident when I do, but at the core a little bit, I always kind of feel like I don't belong in these groups. So what do you mean? Well, it's just when I saw we were number two, I was like, people are going to like not like that. They're not going to be happy that we're number two. People are going to be upset because you and guys barbecue. are because you guys are different. Yeah, because we're different and um, and you have we the, don't, and you have the weird sides well, or we whatever. Just, we, we've <laughs> never gotten the like we've never gotten and this sounds really dumb after the fact, but before that and to an extent sometimes now we've never really gotten a lot of like the cheerleading and like fans. You think you're a bit, you guys are kind of underdogs that I, I made that made like the that. list. That's yeah, how you kind of like feel. That. And okay. I just, we, we were both like, oh my God, we're number two. We just like, you know, Franklin and Snows are, are below us. That's ridiculous. It doesn't make sense. It to, doesn't yeah. make sense. People are going to, are, are going to freak out. Um, you know, Goldie's was number one and congratulations to them. They did, they do great food. Um, super happy for them. But for us, we were like, man, this is, this is wild. It's the biggest deal ever. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you're like you you didn't even think you belong there I just, at I mean, that point, did I've you? Always, I, I always feel like my food is that good. I just never feel like we're gonna get that kind of recognition in the barbecue yeah. space. In food in general. In food in general. I've always felt like I work really really hard. I think I, I think I make great food. I think I create a great atmosphere. Um, I try to work at that level. I just never believed that I would ever get the recognition that our food was on par with that. Right. For whatever reasons, my hang-ups, how they put it together, I just presume there's no way anybody's ever going to and put I, us on I almost on feel like after having heard the whole story like this, I've heard the bits and pieces of this when I've asked you questions over the years, but it's like hearing it like in chronological order from hating, you know, from Noble Pig and hating just where you were at with everything and uh, or Noble, uh, Noble Sandwiches and then shutting it down, rebuilding it from the ground up based on these core values. It almost seems like it came at a time when you were just so lost in the process. Like all this recognition came when you were just you were just kind of in love with the process. Yeah. And I try to tell people that like my buddy Michael that does comedy is very funny. We do the podcast together. You know, mm. he really wants that like recognition. He wants it right now. He's been doing it for a decade and he's, you know, one of the funniest people in town. You mm. know what I mean? And he's in all the right places and spaces. And, and and sometimes he, you know, and I understand because I feel this way too about the podcast, putting a lot of effort in, you know, mm. we're getting great guests, you know what I mean? And the views are slowly coming up, but it's like, I'm just trying to get lost in the process. And I'm yeah. just trying to tell him like, just enjoy this, enjoy this process right now. And then one day it's just the, all that stuff is going to come naturally if yeah. you can get lost in the process. And I think that's exactly, that's what I'm hearing from this is that your head was down when that list came. Your head was down, and you were in the you were in the trenches, just just trying to get kind of lost in in make working on making the best food that you can make. I mean, yes, and it still is. It's like what you were saying that you're that you weren't trying to make you weren't cooking to make that list. No, I wasn't cooking to make that list. I was cooking to make my customers happy and be true to yourself and be true to myself, and you know, just approaching it every day with the best can do attitude. Like I'm gonna make this barbecue the best barbecue I've made since yesterday. Yeah, and the next day I'm gonna try to make it a little bit better than that day. So, you know, I've also told myself too, like, um, thoroughly believing that you're never gonna get recognition, you know, and 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 get these honors. At some point, you have to like, all right, well, I need to come to terms with this. I need to grow up and quit like being prideful and worrying about these things that are essentially ego boosters. Um, right. With the list, it's very much a financial boost too, but mm -hmm. a lot of it is about ego. And I was like, man, I just need to get my shit together and like just focus on doing my thing. Whereas as Find, a young chef, you were more like, I'm what you know, you know I'm worthy of a James yeah. Beard. Oh, I deserve one or yeah. whatever. I'll never get a James Beard. And I'm totally good with that. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to find like happiness in, in my craft. Yes. Yeah. And if if I at the end of the day I could go home and look at my kids and they asked how did the day go and I could tell them we served good food today yeah. and really mean that, that's a win. Yeah. That's a win. That's good. There, there's nothing wrong with that. And if right. you can pay your bills and pay your staff and you can do that every day and be happy, 
You know, there's a lot of people that don't get that in life. If, right. you can, if you can get that, then all the other stuff, as much as you want the recognition, is really irrelevant. But it always seems like that shit comes at a time when, like, like you were so focused on that, and and then and then the recognition just kind of came, and then oh. and then it's like, oh, cool. Yeah. But well, you know, well, you know what they say. It's like luck is what ninety, ninety five percent preparation. Right. You know, maybe, and maybe like focusing the restaurant and getting away from trying to do everything just by simplifying my life and focusing on what's important, truly has yielded much better results. Yeah. Like we've done so much more by trying to do less. Right. Less is more. Yeah. So, yeah, the list drops and it's we're number two. It's crazy. crazy. Yeah. So what did those next couple of days look like? Uh, that afternoon we crushed the bourbon. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> we got our little team together. Hopefully that happened on a Monday, right? Uh, that was uh, yeah, a Monday <laughs> exactly. Sweet. Um, so you were off where you're like, thank God I don't have to work today. We're yeah. celebrating. Uh, got the team together, thanked them profusely, got them, you know, we celebrated. We celebrated because yeah. it was it was a team win. Like, right. At the end of the day, like, I can cook great food, uh, but if I can't help my team cook great food, I am, uh, like, I'm nothing. I you're, not a sh- you're not a chef. Cook. You're not just a chef. cook, right? I'm just a cook. So we celebrated, drank some bourbon. You know, there were some scars from too much bourbon that night, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we had a really good time, and I told the team, I was like, all right, I know what we need to do. I got it. We're going to cook like it's Saturday on two, on Wednesday. Wednesday's the start of our week. We're always closed on Mondays and Tuesdays. Right. And um, the restaurant has pars for, like, slow day Wednesday, and it kind of builds up to Saturday. It's mm-hmm. supposed to be your busiest day, and then Sunday is about like a Saturday. So I told the team, like, I know what we're going to do. We're going to cook like it's a Saturday. We should be good. <laughs> <laughs> well... You know, we open up on Wednesday, and there's a line uh, to the other end of the shopping center. And in the first... Like over by the brewery? Yeah, like down by the tattoo shop heading towards Mm -hmm. the brewery. And I had never seen a line like that, ever. Um, And I was like, dude, again, in like 48 hours, I'm like, we're fucked. Yeah. (laughs) Because we cooked. We cooked. A Saturday's worth of food, and by 11.30, 11.45, we were walking down the line trying to figure out where the disappointment would start <laughs> and tell people that we were, weren't prepared. Right. So, um, so yeah, we sell out that day really early, and I go back in and tell everybody, I know what we need to do now. I, I've finally figured it out. We're going to cook max pars, like just fill the pit up as much right. as we can. And um, for the next two years, we're – trying to figure out how we can cook more food add pits add people so you guys just had one growing. one two pits at the at first we had one one time. yeah we had a thousand gallon pit at the time Crazy. so and now you have th- four of three them? thousand gallon pits and a 500 and that little guy yeah um so yeah it was it was it was really wild i mean you know it's gonna get busy um i presumed it would the, f- the glow would fade and you know things would return to normal we'd just be at a quiet barbecue joint but we've been really lucky that from that day we've only been able to grow the business well you've kept it interesting you add crazy shit to the menu like again playing with that line yeah playing with that barbecue that 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 fine barbecue line that people are scared to cross you know what i mean yeah, doing are. the duck do it with the cherry sauce i mean there, there are other people so out there stuff really pushing it i mean like the for like sure. evan and and uh sawyer over at mm-hmm. Warren lewis i think they are like out there on the edge of what texas barbecue can be there i don't, I don't want, oh yeah don't want to throw any bad words at them but i almost see they're like avant-garde when it comes to like their approach oh, to barbecue they're, absolutely they're really out there pushing it there's a few people out there doing that um who else doesn't serve brisket uh, six days a week or whatever, it's five days That's a week. Wild. I know it's <laughs> kind of genius. It's, it's kind of the biggest one of the biggest flexes in barbecue. Yeah, I feel like it's wild and totally genius. Right, so. and they're still not going to do it. Evan's like, yeah, we don't cook brisket. We don't really need to. Yeah, we have other stuff. If you want to try the beef cheeks, yeah, we want some beef cheeks. Exactly, like barbacado. It's, su- it's or... such a flex. Yeah, I yeah. love it. So, I love it. But yeah, you have to kind of push that line if you want to. You know, it's it's okay to stir shit up a little bit. You do. I mean, because I, it's staying true to yourself as a as a business owner, as a chef, as a creative. You know, and I, I think that's also what set us apart. Like looking back um, at the list and where they took it in this particular time period, I think now there's a recognition in barbecue that everything on the tray has to matter. 
Yeah. Like the pickles have to matter. Right. The sauce has to matter. Uh, introducing thoughtful, well-executed sides matters. Because there was a time I've heard this. The, I, you know, I'm not saying this from my own knowledge, but just from hearing you guys talk, Evan talk, it's like there's there's a time when a lot of the sides and stuff at, in barbecue was were just you know big old tubs of potato salad and and just store bought pickles and it, stuff. I mean pretty much pretty much throwaways yeah just stuff just stuff to to eat with your meats that the focus was just on yeah, yeah. we we cooked the meats I mean there was a point where you could say that the the top 50 list was the top 50 brisket places mm. you know okay. and now I think it's the full encompassing like meal right um but yeah I mean sides and barbecue in Texas never really mattered wasn't until very recently that um, uh, people that were motivated to try to grow the cuisine and make their stamp on barbecue really started thinking about like, well, there's a lot of really good brisket out there. How am I going to stand out? Mm -hmm. Well, let's try to make really good ribs. Let's try to make really good sausage. When that's all happening, it's like, well, let's try to make really good sides to go with this, and let's add thoughtful garnishes to the tray. The game is just really, really leveled up. It's like you yeah. can't just lean on being like a really good cook of uh, brisket now. Mm -hmm. That's not really, it sounds weird, but that's not really special. Yeah, kind of everybody's doing that. Yeah. In Central Texas, there's a there's probably 100 barbecue joints that are making kick-ass brisket. Right. And there's there's like, that information's out there. Yeah. Like you, 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 There's home cooks doing. Yeah. Aaron doing, shared the method. Yeah. You know, the, the, it got out. The secret got out. And right. uh, how to make a consistently good brisket is kind of, you know, it's not easy, but it's kind of common knowledge. Right. You can do it if you want to. If you teach yourself the techniques, you understand sure. how to run your fire, there's there's a there's a blueprint. Right. There is a, there's a way to do it. Um, so that list is about to uh, come out again next year. In 25, yeah. 25, right? Yeah. Is, they do it every four years. Every four years. Yeah. So are you guys, are you are you trying to get back in that headspace, or or have you, I guess, always been trying to stay in that headspace, like we were talking about, of just kind of head down, cooking for cooking for yourself, staying true to yourself, trying to make the best food you can make, and not not worrying too much. But there, but there, pro I'm guessing that there probably is some inherent pressure. Yeah, I mean, because you want to make the list again, and the goal now would be to try to get number one. Because because you don't want to you don't want to you, you you don't want to you can't go you at least retain, right? I mean, uh, so one of the worst things about being number two is is there's very little room to move up, right? And there's a lot of room to fall down, right? Exactly. Uh, you know, and it's a subjective list, man. I sure, mean, it, it is what it is. I get it. For me and for the restaurant and where we're at and where I think we've always been is like, put your head down. Focus on your food. Focus on your guests. That's got to be priority number one. Right. It's like if you make lists and you get these recommendations, that's great. Because nothing lots, can change. There's lots of other lists in barbecue that we don't make. Sure. You know, like I mean, there are guys on podcasts and they run their top fifty, and they didn't going into that last list, they didn't list us because they didn't think we were worthy of being on mm -hmm. there. So lists are subjective. You know, there's right. uh, top barbecue lists for the South. You know, we're not on that list. So I so lists are important. You have to be mindful of their value in possibly making your business a little bit busier or a little bit slower. But at the end of the day, you got to cook for you and for your customers because the lists, you may not make them. Sure. Hell, we might fall off. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I do know that we're going to go to work every day and we're going to try to cook kick ass food. You can't let that kind of arbitrary stuff d distract you from the mission. You can't. Which is to cook good food yeah. and be a, and be a good be a good person. Cook good food, provide hospitality. Yeah. Simple formula that so many people screw up. They don't get the full equation. You know. And you know what you know what the other end of that looks like yeah. of when you're not focusing on that. Exactly. When you're focusing on the mustard. Yeah too much instead of the customers instead of the or customers the staff. or the staff so or but yourself yeah. your own health or yourself but yeah going into the 25 i mean we're just gonna we're just gonna do what we do i mean do I, thing. I honestly feel like our food is better than it was when we made the list in 21 it was better than when we opened up in 19 anybody who tried our food in 19 and 20 and haven't been back i'm sure they would be quite surprised at the level of cooking now 
I'm surprised, and and I mean, you know, this is a biased podcast. You know, it's like sure. I I'm, I spend a lot of time in that restaurant. You know me. We work together. You're you're a, well, not only that, but you're you're an important part of like why this exists mm -hmm. because you 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 know you're one of the first people that believed in me and gave me a chance to do my creative my creative stuff the stuff that i cook mm -hmm. you know which is which is photography video stuff you know what i mean and, and i've been able to hone in on my craft and 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 continue to refine the way that i do things and mm -hmm. so you've helped me grow a lot as a as an artist and as a creative person and and kind of fund you know been part of one of the people that has helped me kind of fund my dreams through through work it's this weird the gift that keeps on giving kind sure. of thing you know what i mean like we have a very i feel like we have a very give and give kind of relationship friendship you know working relationship and uh, so it's like i i i am biased i love the food and i spend a lot of time around it if anyone should be sick of that food it's me because <laughs> i i eat it all the time yeah and i'm around it all the time i'm constantly staring at it on my computer you know what i mean but every time that i have it like it, it's like the first time again mm -hmm. you know what i mean and and i'd tell you you know in private i would hope so I, if, if if anything was off i think i i think i might have told you once well, this tastes a little bit i don't know but for whatever it's worth coming from me yeah. but it's like it it you do keep i don't know tweaking it making you guys are tasting the food all constantly throughout the day yeah, the whole staff you guys do like a tasting tray in the morning yeah. where you cut a little bit of each thing and every staff member kind of takes a pick at it, gives their opinion. I don't think the brisket's on. And it's like, <clears throat> excuse me, as like somebody that doesn't understand that stuff, I'm not a cook, I don't understand, you know, I'm adjacent, I'm chef adjacent or whatever. <laughs> you know, I hang out in, kitchen, in the kitchens a lot, but it's like, I, I can't pick out these little things that you got, you know, sometimes Holden will be like, ribs are off today. You know, and yeah. it's like, it tastes like the best ribs I've ever had. But it's like, you guys can pick and chew, pick out these little things. And I think it is that kind of constant, you know, refining, going back to the drawing board, yeah. tasting. You know, I feel like, do, do you think chefs go and like, go a long time sometimes without tasting their food? Like, do you think they get up to a point where they make a list or whatever, and they're kind of like, oh, we're done, we made it, everything, every, the way we do stuff is perfect. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, do you think that that, that those types of people exist? Cause, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And not because they don't care about their job. Sure. I mean, you get, honestly, you get tired and burnt out doing the same thing over and over. Um, lots of, I feel that. A lot of cooks and a lot of young cooks make the mistake of not tasting their food constantly. Um, even seasoned chefs get to the point where, like, uh, my recipes are rock solid. Like, there's no reason. Right. You know, so as soon as you stop tasting your food and critically and analyzing it, um, that's when you start to slip. Mm -hmm. You know, so, yeah, um, you know, part of our process to get where we're currently at is we try the food every day, uh, all the meats, all the sides. Um, I try all the pickles and all the sauces. I taste everything that we make pretty much daily. Um, and the staff does as well. And we... You know, you get down to splitting hairs. Right. And how can we make this better? How can this improve? You know, we now a lot of times I will pick a protein or an item and say, after thought, that I feel like we can improve this. Like, this is pretty good. Like, I'm proud to serve this. Sure. But can I make this a little bit better? Mm -hmm. And that's where we've been really playing the game of our with our food is like, how can we slowly and incrementally improve some aspect of our food daily or customer service daily right you know how yeah, can we, not just the food but yeah, the how, experience how can we come in and make this a little bit better for our guests adding things like the online pre-order so yeah. locals and regulars don't have to wait in the big tourist kind of line exactly right and how you know we talk about hospitality and we talk about the food and everybody's opinion on the team matters um, i can't run the restaurant based off of 25 people's different opinions um but i take it all in and internalize it and figure out take that feedback and try to like make something just a little bit better yeah so that's that's where we're currently at and i think you have to taste your food you have to be critical of your food and i think it's good to get away from your food too like leave for a week and come back and try it with a fresh palate again after you because you get desensitized to your food you try it day in day out right getting away is a great gift mm -hmm. you've been traveling a lot We've been fortunate. We've been lucky to, to get out and go do things for the right. first time in my life as a restaurateur. I 
now have had the opportunity to travel a little bit, which I mean, you've been all over. You went to Brazil, yeah, and cooked barbecue in Brazil, and <laughs> then and then didn't you have that pit that you cooked on in Brazil? You had such a good time there that you had that. What's the story with the pit? Uh, so Mario, um, he lives in Brazil. He's a barbecue fanatic. He builds pits down there. He came to Texas uh, pre-list um, and was just asking about barbecue pits. And how do you put them together? And what do you like cooking on them? And talked to this, you know, barbecue fanatic from Brazil for about an hour one day when I was out there cooking, and I thought I'd never see him again. Mm-hmm. Um, fast forward to oh gosh, I guess twenty-two. Yeah, twenty-two. I think it was when we went to Sao Paulo. Um, we get invited to go to Sao Paulo to cook a churrascada. Amazing, like, food festival. Probably the most important food festival in Brazil every year. I didn't realize that going into it. I just was like, oh, cool, let's go to Brazil. Yeah. You know, we'll go cook barbecue for a few people. I'm down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I get the invite, and then Maria reaches out to me and says, hey, you know, it would be a great help to me and an honor if you would allow me to make you a barbecue pit. And I was like, dude, that's so dumb. <laughs> Like, yeah. like, don't make me a barbecue pit. Yeah, that's, that's like, a lot of work, dude. That's extremely gracious and super kind to you and, and uh, very unnecessary. And he says, like, no, it, you would be doing me a favor because I will never get my barbecue pits in this festival unless I have an in. Right, okay. So I was like, well, I was still very skeptical because I didn't really understand the event yet. I was still very skeptical. And I was like, well, if it'll help you, I will – I'll do what I can. Common, common, good guy, John. Yeah. Move, <laughs> uh, sticking your neck out for people. Yeah. So I, I, I tell the the guy in charge of the festival, uh, Gustavo. I was like, "Hey, man, I'm coming down to Brazil. I know everything's going to be different, but there is a guy who will, has an offset barbecue pit and let me cook on it. If you'll let me get into the festival, can you make this happen for me?" And he was like, "Well, we have these sponsors, and I think it'll be fine, but we just need to make sure you know that we really focus on our sponsors and." Sure. Yada yada yada, and I'll you know I but get you made it. it happen for this guy. Yeah, I get it. You know, you have they're he's trying to make this thing work for him too. So, um, but he let us put the pit in there, and uh, it was a huge success. The event was um, pretty wild. Two thousand Brazilians eating barbecue, partying. eating Texas barbecue. That's so cool. Uh, my little bit of Texas yeah. barbecue. Uh, I see. The cool thing about that event is it's uh, it's chefs from all over the world. Okay. And it's a it's a barbecue event, but it's really more of a live fire event. So you've got guys from England, from Australia, from all over Brazil, parts of Africa, um, just really from literally. Which for people that don't know is just an event where you are you have to cook on some form of an open fire. Yeah, right? yeah. So there were guys cooking with center block pits and big fires and doing whole hogs. There were people like me doing pork belly on an offset barbecue pit. There were guys cooking on Ferris wheels. <laughs> <laughs> guys cooking on ferris wheels yeah like he had this oh like like a ferris rotisserie wheel. thing yeah, yeah, yeah okay one guy was cooking a whole a whole cow on this like can, monster contraption can we look up that barbecue festival see if we can find anything it's called so, church Chur- churrascada churrascada yeah how do you spell it oh man I can't c-h-u-r spell just look up brazil barbecue fest and then type in like c-h-u-r yeah, churrascada. see if we can find it but yeah so anyway you, wild, you, wild, wild events. Great people. You know, you're cooking food for like 2,000 Brazilians, and mm-hmm. they just do it different down there, man. They their zest for life and having a good time is just very different than here in the states. Interesting. And they just go hard. You know, yeah. Doors open up at noon, and uh, they told me beforehand. It was like, oh yeah, it's going to be an eight-hour festival. And you got to cook for 2,000 people. Yeah, there you go. There's some of it. Damn. And I was like, yeah, whatever. They'll be done by two, and we'll just be hanging out. And it literally goes hard the whole time. Yeah, it's just a party. Yeah, and, well, and people – They, they know how to have a good time. They do it different. Like here in, uh, here in Texas, you'll see people running around with trays, grabbing little bites from everybody they can get. Then they go sit down and they eat it all. Half of it's cold. They don't know right. what came from where. It's an it's an event of excess. Yeah, they eat real fast and then everybody's tapped out in the two hours. At this event, people would like roam in groups and stop by your station and have a conversation with you, mm-hmm. ask some questions. Want to know why this weird white guy from Texas is cooking, you know, pork belly with a native fruit in Brazil? Like, what are you doing here? Tell us your story. Did you and, do like the peach tea pork belly, but with a different fruit? Um, yeah. There's um, when I signed up for this event, uh, Gustavo asked what I wanted to cook with, and I said, "Well, uh, 
I'll do my belly because people love it, but I want to cook with a native fruit. Can you make some recommendations? And he said, well, do you want something that's common here or something that's exotic here? And I was like, the exotic. The more exotic, the better. Mm -hmm. So I butcher it every time I say it. I never pronounce it right, but it's called Jobatika Baka. Jobatika Baka? Yeah, which is not the right pronunciation because everybody laughed at me every time I said it. <laughs> <laughs> see if you can find, see if you can spell that one, Tony. That's yeah. a little spelling bee for you, dude. Essentially, it's like Jobatika a, Baka. Yeah, it, basically, it's like a grape that grows on uh, the Brazil Brazil exotic fruit, like rainforest trees in Brazil. It okay. grows on the trunk, and so basically, it's like an ornamental grape that nobody, well, some people go with, but a lot of people don't. And so they were really like surprised that I was cooking with that fruit, being from Texas. Uh, so yeah, it was it was fun. That's was awesome. Fun. And you made like a glaze out of it. Yeah, sweet. Yeah, what did it tastes like. Um, the sweet or more tart. It, it, very similar to like grape. Okay. Um, Interesting. Is that so look what it looks like? Joba yeah. tea kaba. That's it right there, man. There we found it. Good job, Tony. Yeah. See, Tony's the man. That's crazy. It grows like on the bark of the tree. Yeah, it's wild. It looks like a barnacle or something. Yeah, and like I said, I think. I could be wrong because I don't really know. It looks like a plum almost. Um, a but I think plum. a lot of people grow it as an ornamental down there. J what does that mean? Just, just like to, to look cool? Decorative. Yeah. You know, not to, not to like. It does kind of look like a Christmas. like a To actually eat. Like a purple Christmas ornament. Interesting. So the cool thing t to me is that you had that pit. Yes. Shipped over here. And now it's in front of the restaurant yeah. because, and it's just kind of like, that's a thing that I feel like you didn't have to do. There's a bunch of people who make pits right down the road. There's sure. the mill scale guy. There's all these awesome dudes making dope pits. And you have a few from a few of them. But it's like, um, you're like, no, I want that. I want that one because there's a story there. Well, I mean, so we get through the event. Everybody's blown away because they've never had a pit like that at, the, at that event. Um, and then afterwards, Maria's like, hey, um, I don't really have anywhere to put this thing. <laughs> it's <laughs> and huge. And I'm looking at him like, oh, that's okay. You're like, what do you want me to do about that? He's like, would you like the pit? And I was like, well, I can't check that shit, man. Yeah, I can't <laughs> take that on the plane, bro. I was like, how are we going to do that? And he was like, look, we'll figure it out. Um, why don't you go home, and I'll get back to you in a few weeks, and we'll see if we can figure out how to get it to Texas. Mm -hmm. And so the short version of that is we ended up uh, loading it onto shipping containers. It shipped out of On the a port boat. of Brazil and Crazy. Santos in Brazil. And uh, it took about four weeks, but it, it landed at the port of Houston. And I took my Chevy S10, and I went down there and picked it up with a trailer and drug it home. That's awesome, dude. <laughs> so, And uh, it's, it's beautiful, and it's a, it's a, it cooks really well. I mean, it's a great pit, and it's got a great story. And um, just, I don't know, I was, I was proud to be able to bring it back. You know, and that's that shit that I feel like you care about that maybe some people overlook those those things. Well, like it's our, like it's now that now you walk out of the restaurant, you see that thing yeah. and you remember. It's part of Chiriscata. our story. Yeah. You know, and that you're, you're, it's kind of what you're doing in food and hospitality is telling a little bit of a story sure. through food. So it allows us to when people come out there and tour the pits and they're like, well, what's this pit? You know, where'd this come from? It's mm -hmm. well, you know, it happened because of these travels. Right. So Let's talk. Uh, we probably can wrap up here in a little bit. Tony, how long have you been going? Hour 43. Nice. Nice. That's good. We're, we're ripping, dude. We're yeah. ripping right through it. You having a good time? I am having a blast. Me too. Um, I do want to talk about something that could use a little bit of promotion. And maybe you could tell, while we're on the subject of telling stories, mm -hmm. you could tell us the story of why you decided instead of maybe opening a second interstellar or some other kind of barbecue related thing, you decided to open up a taco truck <laughs> because I think people might be a, uh, you know, curious and stoked to find out. And there's mm -hmm. probably, cause it's so new still that I think sure. a lot of people don't really know it's about it yet. Radar, it's so. a little, we're a little under the radar over there, yeah. but also, um, I think the reason that you did it, I think there's, you know, everybody kind of gets a little, Woo, when uh you know especially i think in texas when a when a white guy wants to open up a taco truck taco <laughs> truck but i think that you have a very good story behind it and a good reason for doing it All right. um and maybe you know if you could share some of that with people well um so I understand I, as i uh, alluded to earlier or mentioned earlier that some of the things i love most in life are tacos and barbecue and chicken fried steak mm -hmm. those are like my childhood foods so grew up eating those things 
Um, with Interstellar, we've been blessed, and it's running great. I've got a great team. And I did, uh, unfortunately, break one of my rules in life. Instead of trying to make my life simpler, I have succumbed to making my life more difficult. Um, so we opened up a trailer. Uh, like the barbecue place, though, um, I wanted to kind of emulate um, the, the method with that in the sense that if I was going to do something else, it needed to be something that I really loved and something that I felt like I could um, put my own stamp on and maybe share something a little different. And sticking to those kind of core values. Yeah. 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 So um, growing up in Corpus Christi, uh, it's a really diverse city. Um, you don't really know this when you're growing up because you're just growing up and you don't think of like stuff like that. It doesn't matter when you're a kid sure. that you know, the majority of your friends are come from Hispanic families and it's just, it's really integrated down there. Um, and it's beautiful. It's a coastal it's, town it's for coastal people that don't know where it's at. On the coast of Corp uh, Texas, like 250, 300, thought maybe it's where Selena was from. Right? Yes. Yeah, Selena's from there. Uh, a few other, you know, minor celebrities. Um, but when we gather down there, it's usually in the backyard, you're grilling, um, you've got people from different backgrounds bringing, you know, barbecue and homemade flour tortillas and trays of enchiladas and homemade picos and salsas and, you know, hot dogs and burgers. It's this beautiful mashup of a lot of different people. Right. And that's how we celebrate down there. That's the kind of food I grew up eating. It was always with flour tortillas. And I decided if I was going to open up a taco trailer, I should share a little bit of my experiences growing up in South Texas. So that's what we're trying to do with the menu. So mm -hmm. it's got some smoke elements. It's got some, some you know, grilled elements. Um, everything is served, you know, taco style with tortillas and um, flour tortillas that we make from scratch and roll out by hand. Some really great uh, uh, corn tortillas from a, a beautiful little tortilla factory in San Antonio uh, called Colonial. Um, and we're just trying to bring people a little bit of that, that, that Corpus Christi flavor, you mm -hmm. know, that is kind of missing in Austin, uh, I think. So. Even among all the tacos that we have here, yeah, it's like, just not exactly how they did it. And you're you're kind of always looking for that thing that well, I replicated the uh, the moment of you know when people were like, "So you're opening a barbecue place because we need another barbecue place." They're like, "So you're opening a taco place like we need another taco trailer." And right. I'm like, "But I think I got something to offer." Yeah. Um, but I'm doing it my way. Uh, you know. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm replicating the same thing. Right. So we serve um, brisket that we smoke and chop and. Uh, cooked down with homemade uh, longanisa, uh, you know, Mexican style sausage. Mm -hmm. We're doing uh, chicken thighs that we're smoking and serving as a taco with crispy chicken chicharrones and a uh, real nice That crema. chicken taco is banging. It's dope. Yeah. Um, we're also sharing some things that I didn't realize were things. Like I, when I grew up in Corpus Christi, um, family friend would make us snacks and a lot of times it would be either hot dogs rolled up in flour tortillas with cheese or hot dogs rolled up with corn tortillas and cheese and they would fry them. That's known as a crispy dog. Mm -hmm. um, it's a kind of a regional food, uh, very specific to San Antonio. Its origins start there. Um, I love them. They're banging. Mm -hmm. So we serve my version of that. Um, you know, we do um, smoked lamb. We're going to be rolling carne gasada onto the menu. Um, so, which is kind of like a stew. It's kind of like a stew, right? It's a stew. Yeah. And yeah. um, basically, it's like a meat gravy. Um, in South Texas, it's very rich with comino. A little bit of Mexican oregano, some tomatoes, some onions, some bell pepper, and you stew chunks of beef down. And you make this beautiful, rich stew. It's common to have it there for breakfast with uh, flour tortillas. So we're going to mm -hmm. serve that here for lunch and dinner. And where can people find that? Just so they know, it's Yellow Bell Tacos. By yes. the way, it's called. Yeah, Yellow Bell Tacos. Why um, the name Yellow Bell? Because eh, I liked it. Yeah, it's a that's a <laughs> Texas flower, right? It is. Okay. So, there, so there are these yellow bell flowers that are native to Texas, and I wanted to come up with a name that I liked um, but didn't sound like the barbecue bro was opening up a taco right. joint. Smoky, Smoky John's tacos or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I just didn't want it to be so dang obvious, you know. Sure. So I also wanted Smart. something that was pretty and floral and just put off a different vibe completely. Right, from the gritty kind of barbecue. Yeah. yeah. So I just, I, w I wanted to have its own identity. It was really important to me if we are going to do another project that it it not just be like, oh, that's Interstellar serving tacos with right. with brisket. Galaxy in. tacos or yeah, something like that. Something sure. you know, kind of lame. Yeah. Um, so I, I chose Yellow Bell Tacos because it made all my family happy. 
they smiled and they said they liked it. I threw yeah. a bunch of names at them, but that was sure. the one that got the Leslie, best response. Leslie approved. Leslie approved. Ivan approved. Loretta approved. Um, and I was like, well, if it's it's good enough for my the people that I love the most, then this is what we're gonna roll with. Then the people will love it. Well, right. we'll see. Remains yeah. to be seen. I mean, but, I think people love it. Um, so we're located. Uh, we partnered up with Austin Beer Works. Um, they. If you don't know them, they're a great, one of the original local craft breweries here. They make beautiful Pilsners and IPAs and Stouts. Um, really great company run by some amazing people. Mm-hmm. They have opened up a second tap room in northeast Austin off of Springdale Road. And, and so, it is a hang out there. Yeah, it's definitely a hang. It's beautiful, huge yard. Yeah. People bring their kids, their dogs. There's yeah. like a playground. It's huge. I it's mean, huge. They bought like 80 acres. It's wild. And they're going to eventually have uh, another brewery there, but right now they just have a second tap room. Mm-hmm. Um, they have partnered up with Mint Discs and have created a world-class uh, disc golf course there. Mm-hmm. Um, there's lots of room for the kids and for the dogs, uh, lots of space. And yeah. we are the food component partnered with the only food there yeah, yeah. partnered with the, the brewery so that's awesome yeah yeah it's great food and uh, i i think that its potential has yet to be seen it's got good potential i think when when people figure it out yeah. it'll be it'll be great and, you know it's, it's the, the space out there it's a, they're kind of trailblazers that's a that stretch of road may one day become like the north east version of Fitzhugh Road which definitely. you know that's where like Jester King is at oh yeah okay some other breweries and now some distilleries it's become this great like thoroughfare that was just a little outside of Austin mm-hmm. this you know this thoroughfare is in Austin technically but it's got lots of land out there that's undeveloped mm-hmm. and some underserved neighborhoods so I think um, they might be the spark that creates this new corridor of great food and beverage out there yeah kind of underserved area a little bit yeah. out there they need some love yeah for sure why and then one more question i just had um why interstellar why the name why did that why that name since we're <laughs> on the subject of names again uh, like yellow belts because i like it mm-hmm. <laughs> um it wasn't a really good reason back when i was running the sandwich shop um to try to improve employee morale we'd have a yearly party hot sauce competition and me and my partner would cook food for everybody the bosses would cook food for everybody's families and we did barbecue um a couple times and during one of those sessions uh, i was probably drinking a little too much beer and pondering my uh, escape from sandwiches and mm-hmm. said i should do a barbecue pop-up because i'm really good at this which i was terrible at the time <laughs> And, and they were like, oh, yeah, well, you can call that barbecue pop-up. And I started naming off names, joking around, and stumble across Interstellar Barbecue and make a few jokes and, uh, you know, get some smiles. Mm-hmm. Uh, then, you know, kind of forget about it. And then about six months later, we actually – I decide to, you know, I'm really starting to get the itch of, like, maybe trying to figure a way out of Change the sandwiches. Restaurant. Yeah. And I said, well, if we're going to move into barbecue, we should at least do a couple of pop-ups and see if I – a, enjoy it. Do we get good customer feedback? Um, is it fun? And uh, I was kind of in the weeds, running a restaurant, trying to do a pop up. And Leslie was like, "So, what are you calling this pop up? Because it's in like a week." <laughs> and I'm like, "Um, uh, Interstellar. Well, we'll call it Interstellar Barbecue. We'll probably only do it once. It won't matter." And uh, <laughs> it went over really well. Uh, people had a good time. And afterwards. I looked at Leslie and I said, it's going to be Interstellar Barbecue, right? And she says, yeah, I think we should do that. It sounds fun. Yeah. And, um, you know, good side effect is it just makes for good puns and jokes. Sure. And um, we can use that. We can use the rocket ship emoji. Yeah. Uh, And the other thing, too, about it is I didn't want to, like, I I didn't want it about me. Right. Like Bates Barbecue or something. Uh, Right. Aside from all the terrible jokes that comes from Bates Barbecue, um, you know, (laughs) I just, I didn't want to name it after myself. I didn't want to be that obvious to, like, in Austin, there's a million barbecue joints. And, you know, whether you love Interstellar or think it's a terrible name, it does stand out. Sure. You know, like, yeah. there's no other name like ours. It's in not Austin someone's last name. When it comes or to barbecue and in the rest of the barbecue world, it's always, you know, obvious names like something about wood or, or smoke or yeah. fire or the person's name in it which you know they should be proud of the, the hard work they did and put their name on the restaurant or they've got a good story that comes back to barbecue that's where most of the names come from right so i just me being me i didn't want to do it you know average way i wanted to say like well let's 
let's just be different. Just do something fun. Yeah, let's do something fun. Yeah. So yeah, that's where cool. the name came from. And I wish I had a better answer, like something deep and meaningful. Like, no, that's all right. I thought it means. was a Steve Miller band thing because uh, you like you liked Steve Miller band a lot. Like I do. Yeah, you do like the sta- uh, space cowboy events and I stuff. Do. And there's some subtleties to let Lynn to your rock and the roll. The menu hints but. to some of the my likes and classic rock for mm-hmm. sure. Um, it tied in well with that. I think. Yeah. You know that was kind of a a byproduct of the name. It's like we're going to be interstellar barbecue. Uh, for a while there, I was going to get bunch of sandwiches on the menu thank god i didn't do that because you were gonna go regress right yeah, back to your fucking was, sandwich just thing. trying to go backwards and we were gonna have a whole lineup of like you know in order from the song we were gonna have like the maurice and the uh that's your pit, that's your pit's name right maurice space cowboy sandwich a joker right it was like oh this is gonna be great it's gonna look so good on the menu and everybody who knows steve miller band will get the reference <laughs> And then I looked at it and I was like, no, I'm, I'm turning myself into a sandwich. You're shop relapsing. Again. Yeah. It's like, we can't do this. Get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> so we now have, uh, we have uh, the Gangster Love Sandwich, um, the Maurice, and then uh, we have uh, Maurice out. So the- you, you let yourself have a couple. Yeah, a couple. A couple. Yeah. So, so. You got to have at least, you got to have a chop sandwich on your menu. Right. You got to have right. one composed sandwich on your menu. I just didn't want to turn noble into a smoky version of noble with a different name i wanted to right. try to have a clean break yeah focus on meats and sides and not so much about in between bread right you didn't want to get back to that where we started this conversation exactly yeah exactly and it's just you know when you make a big change like that it, it needs to have i think people when they come in they need to feel it that it's a real change not mm-hmm. just like oh oh he's we're now barbecue right he rebranded and and yeah. it's really just the same place but it's just with a different name and they say they're barbecue especially would, because it was so important to you the changes that you did make yeah yeah so you well, wanted really to, had to gut the resonate menu. yeah so i wanted to really de- de-emphasize sandwiches and really try to be like a counter style like market driven barbecue joint yeah like the places that i admired what's is there anything uh that you want to do the, in the future down the road, like like Yellow Bell, you know, that you haven't done yet? Is there anything, like, without giving anything away or whatever, is there anything that, like, you'd like to do? You know, do you still have dreams beyond these two restaurants oh, yeah, of man. things that you want to do? I want to win the international chili competition in Turtle Lingua. That's one of my life goals. Okay. You make uh, a damn good chili, my favorite chili. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm thoroughly embracing my Texas roots. My family goes back to Texas almost 200 years. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm anything, I'm a Texan. Technically, I'm an American, but I'm really a Texan at heart. Sure. So I figure if I can make a great list in barbecue, and I can make a list or two with tacos, and I can make some noise with my chili, I will have fulfilled my uh, my career as a a Texas, Texas chef. Okay, so be on the lookout for yeah. a chili a chili cook off. And it looks like it's a really good party out there. Yeah, so <laughs> I just want to go Terra hang. Lingua. Yeah, you know, go cool. throw down some beers, eat some and chili, eat some chili, and hang out in Terra Lingua because yeah. it's pretty dope out there. In West is that Texas. where is that in Texas? It's okay. West Texas. West yeah, Texas. it's, it's uh, between Big Ben National Park mm-hmm. and Big Ben State Park. Um, it's just a stretch of beautiful blue skies and cactus and it's the desert yeah. man i really dig it will we ever see uh like a sauce line or any other pro- products um down the road oddly enough we are trying to get our stuff together and yeah. roll out some professionally bottled sauces nice and maybe some spice rubs that's one of our goals for this year sweet so i would love to maybe be able to offer our peach tea glaze to oh, folks that would be crazy to cook with that would be crazy uh, so we're trying to get the packaging done on that and see if we can get that rolled out Right on, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, dude, and uh, just for everything that you've done for me and for barbecue, for you know the restaurant industry. You're you're a really good person, one of my favorite people, and I'm just so blessed to know you, know you and call you a friend. Um, look in that camera and plug. Let people know where to find your personal and all your uh, different businesses and things. Okay, so um, you can find me most of the time at Interstellar Barbecue. We're in Northwest Austin. Um, social media handles are Interstellar BBQ at wherever you want to find us, Twitter, Instagram, or X, or whatever the hell Twitter is yeah. now. Um, with Yellow Bell, uh, you can find us, same thing, Yellow Bell Tacos. We're out in Northwest Austin at Austin Beer Works. Um, Sprinkle Valley location. Sprinkle Valley, yeah. Mm-hmm. Make sure you clear that up because they do have two locations. But, yeah, that's where you can find us. And Chef John Bates on Instagram. Yeah, right? Chef John Bates on Instagram, on Facebook. Everything kind of correlates pretty well. I don't have a lot of different handles. So everything sure. is like, if you want to find Interstellar, just look up 
Interstellar BBQ. Um, you can pre-order your your next Interstellar, right? Yes, you if can. you want to skip the line, you can yeah. pre-order. We're trying to push that if more. If you're a hypocrite like me who likes to make lines but doesn't like to wait in lines, <laughs> uh, you can order barbecue through our pre-order system, which is great because uh, you can pick your time. We reserve all your food for you. You come in, pick up your food, be in and out like five minutes, and you can wave at the line and laugh at them as you go off. You can even get a coffee while you pick it up. You can have a well-made espresso, cappuccino, Americano. Uh, but, yeah, the pre-order thing's been really cool because we're trying to get food to our old school guests. Right, who are like, well, I, I remember when there was no line or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you kind of take care to, of those people again. Back when they used to say things like, man, we love you guys. You're the best. I don't want to tell anybody about you because <laughs> – great barbecue and no line i'm right. like yeah that's awesome i'm yeah. trying to pay my bills dude yeah we kind of need you know to <laughs> meet yeah. in the middle on that how one. about you tell somebody but you tell them not to tell anybody right exactly so but yeah, oh, yeah. That, that gets them back in uh, it's also really great for um like smaller parties getting the boys together for a super bowl party fishing or something uh, birthday fishing just just because you have family in town uh offices those sorts of things you can take all the weight out and it's pretty cool so sure. Well, thanks again, John. Yeah. Appreciate, appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you, brother. Yeah. Good chatting with Run you. that intro or outro. You are listening to Gorgas. You idiot.